And uh, do you tell Amherst Media to go or Pam? Amherst Media should be all set. I'm just going to text them. I know that they're there. Oh, they're t we're live. Okay. Okay. We're Great. So, uh, Pam, if you can bring up the agenda on the screen, that would be wonderful. And I will begin. Call to order. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of May 20th, 2020, based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020, this planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Christine Gray Mullen, and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 634. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will now take a roll call. Board members, as you hear your name called, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourselves back on mute. Michael Burt Wessel. He's waving. Okay, I, I recognize his wave. Uh, Maria Chow. Present. Here. Okay. Thank you. Jack Jemsick. Yes, I'm present, but um, did we, I didn't get the email for the link for this Zoom. There was a little technical issue. Nobody did. Okay. So that's right, why no Amory sent it to you. But okay, great. Glad no you're problem. here. Thanks right. for figuring it out. Um, <laughs> David Levenstein. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> Doug Marshall. Present. And Janet McGowan. Here. Board members, if a technical uh, difficulties, if they arise, we may need to pause temporarily to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let IT, tonight it's Sean or Pam, know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note a disconnection has occurred. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. You will see your raised hand and call and be called upon to speak. After speaking, remember to re-mute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public uh, comment period and at other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during the public comment period, you must sign in the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide and can be entered into a, a search engine by typing HTTPS uh, semico, uh, no colon backslash backslash amherstmass.zoom.us backslash j backslash 920124977678. This link can also be found on the meeting agenda, which is located on the town website in two ways. One way is through the calendar listing for this meeting on the home page and find the link within the event details. A second way is to go to the planning board web page and click on the most recent agenda link for tonight. Uh, the agenda there has a link, a Zoom link that is towards the top of the page where it states virtual meeting. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called upon, please identify yourself, stating your full name and address, and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If these guidelines are not complied with or the speaker exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Moving onward, the slide will show now show the meeting agenda for this evening. Again, note the virtual meeting Zoom link at the top. So we will move right on to the agenda. Um, first one is minutes. We did receive minutes um, for March 4th. This is for a second time. Um, Janet McGowan wanted to add some comments. It was around four o'clock it went out. Did everybody have time to go through those um, and read them? And if anyone didn't, um, you can uh, click raise hand or I have to get that part up on my screen. Um, Christine, I can put those up on the screen if you want. Um, 
Yeah, that we could do that. Um, and then, yeah. so I'm looking for hands for anyone who didn't have time to read the minutes. Um, I see Jack's hand. I see Michael's. Um, so if you can unclick your hand. So I'm going to just ask first off, should we wait and go another two weeks so that there, there's a lot of comments in there. So if you, if anyone raised their hand for wait two weeks or do them now. I see one hand from Jack and one from Michael. Okay, so we'll just give this, we'll just table this for two weeks. Uh, Chris, do you have a mass, you know, I know we're trying to expedite these and get them up. Um, can we wait and do that? Is that all right? Just, I mean, we didn't get them till four o'clock this Christine, afternoon. Uh, my hand was up to say that I think it's time we should, we should review the minutes. I read them, I think they're appropriate. Uh, I think we should uh, approve them. Okay, Jack, was that what your hand is up or do you want to wait for two weeks? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, so I, um, it's just, I just briefly skimmed through it, but I just, you know, um, I didn't think the language was perfect, <laughs> whatever it says, you know, in terms of uh, saying very or, or, you know, many, I, I just, was uncomfortable with some of the terminology that was in there. However, if everyone's good with it, I'm good with it. But I do feel like we're kind of going over the top in terms of editing these minutes, really. Um, it's my opinion. Um, so we can go over them if everyone's comfortable with it. Um, I was also uncomfortable with some of the changes to the point where I spent an hour today reliving the dream and watch the Amherst media to reconfirm what was being said. Um, so I do have some issues and it will take some discussion to go through these suggested, um, all these changes. So um, David, I, I recognize you, I see your hand up. Thank you, I agree. I think that, that I, I'd be happy to um, vote on the, min the minutes as drafted now I do believe that there is uh, uh, that, that there do um, uh, that they're going more towards transcript than towards uh, minutes and that they are encapsulating or they're trying to capture more editorial con content rather than the substance or gist of the meeting which is what I would Think that the minutes would would do, and so I think we're we're getting close. But for the purpose of of staff time and and our own time, uh, I, I'd be you know willing to to vote and approve them. But I do think that we should be cautioned about going overboard in trying to represent um, uh, such detail and um, inevitably capturing one or two points of view rather than just the gist of the meeting. Thank you. Um, I just want to add part of, so I did go back and watch video and minutes are not exposed to express personal opinion of ours. Um, that's one of the reasons why we don't do the minutes and um, like Pam does them and tries to capture the general flavor. Um, so some of the words that have been suggested, when I went back and watched the video, it's not, exa it's not exactly what happened. Um, the other part is some of it is um, she's adding comments to other people, what they said. Um, and I just want to make sure, you know, like she altered things that like Michael, which Michael says he's fine. Um, I don't know if Doug has looked at um, the paragraph that she wrote about what he said. Um, so I just want to make sure that people are comfortable with that. I know when I go over minutes, I mean, especially these, we're talking 20 pages of minutes here. I mostly look the hardest on what I was quoted in saying, because that's what I remember best too. I can't always remember what other people said exactly. Um, uh, David, I see a visual hand. I'll call on you, and then I see Michael's next. Well, it, it, uh, I, I, if 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 you went back to review the tra uh, the the recording, and if things were captured in the revised minutes that did not in your um, review of the recording, 
mm-hmm. were not present, then I'm not comfortable approving the minutes um, as, dra- as currently drafted. And so I would rather then table it within the, the work to do to review the meeting. Um, but I think then we've crossed over a line um, in the, the, the detail that the minutes are trying to capture, again, rather than the gist. This is not a transcript. That's the purpose of the recording. That's, thank you. So I would, I would rather table um, the, the vote of the minutes if there is an apparent mm, you know, uncomfortableness between the actual recording and the, the, the currently revised draft. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize. I think Michael, do you still, I see your hand went down, but do you still want to talk, Michael? Well, my, my hand is up, um, actually. I have to, sorry, I got so many screens here. Oh, yes, you're rolled up there. Yes, and then next is Doug. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, I did not review minutes and watch the video of the meeting at the same time. Uh, I reviewed the minutes basically having, a, having felt that the original minutes were reasonable and uh, reviewing uh, the, the, the um, uh, suggestions and additions uh, that Janet had put in, particularly uh, you're looking at uh, the, uh, the uh, minutes, the section of the minutes that was attributed to me, I found that reasonable. The attribution to, my, to what I said found that reasonable. Again, without reviewing the minutes in terms of what I said, I think that's what I would have probably would have said or would hope to have said. And so I uh, approve the minutes. I would suggest we approve the minutes based on that. If other people have not reviewed the minutes relative to what they individually said, then I think we should wait until people have a chance to do that. But it seems to me the minutes ought to reflect what the, uh, primarily what the individual members of the board uh, believe they uh, intended to say whether in fact they said those exact words or not, I think is less relevant than whether it represents their position on the issues. So uh, I would think that we ought to, again, uh, following along with what David said, everybody ought to look at what they said, what they are uh, quoted as saying or or referenced to say, and seeing if that that supports what they, if that represents what their position is. And then if so, then we should approve the minutes. If not, those individuals should adjust what is attributed to them. Um, Good points, Michael. I just want to add that, um, so most of the comments I want to a little bit push back on were beyond what we were saying. Um, It was what Mr. Reedy was saying, what uh, Mr. Mora was saying. Um, I don't think some of those additions were exactly you know, it's a little bit, it's perception. And so right here, like I'm uncomfortable, you know, I don't want it to be she says, she says, if I'm like, oh, well, you know, Janet wrote this, but then I went and looked at the video and that's not how I see it. Um, I think I would rather just, I'd be comfortable with just sending an email to Chris and Pam on the, the, the comments that I have an issue with and why, and that they can go look at the video or go back to their minutes and adjust. Um, because there should be a continuity in these minutes too. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. I, I, you know, I don't want to waste more of our time debating on like, oh, well, you know, and me reading what actually was said at the video. It, it's, can we just do that? And then um, I'm going to recognize Doug next and then Janet and uh, Chris and Pam think about it, you know, what you think might be best here. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I thought I had reviewed the minutes, but I'd only looked at the first few pages and it, I was unaware of the rest of it. So uh, I am one of those who didn't get a real chance to look through the whole thing. You know, we've, we, we're we close to having a full conversation today about the minutes. You know, if if uh, if we, we're not ready to vote on them with or without those amendments, then I think we should table and move on. Okay. Uh, Janet, I recognize you. So, um, I, you know, when I first looked at these minutes, I thought that some of the thing, the information I had presented on parking at um, Main Street LLC, all that information wasn't there. And that kind of got me wondering why that wasn't there. And so I did listen to the transcript. I didn't listen to the whole thing, 
But um, as I went ahead to the discussion on the master plan, looking for Michael's comments, because I remember him saying something, I, I was starting to really listen to the meeting and what Rob Morrow was saying about the process for working with closely with the zoning subcommittee and the planning board. And none of that really came out in the minutes. And it seems really important to me that we, that process that he was outlining, which is flexible and working closely with both committees and the need for consultants for the bigger issues and the need to work with people in the town to get their support for the bigger questions about like how big should buildings being in downtown, that wasn't in the minutes. And so that seemed really important to me. So I actually, I, I, maybe I should do this more often. I found that discussion on the master plan very rich and very deep. And I felt like, you know, maybe because they're very long minutes, all those things weren't captured. Another reason it sort of popped out as being important to me is I was at a CRC meeting and they were talking about maybe getting rid of the zoning subcommittee and, you know, kind of pushing back a little bit on the planning board's role in zoning changes. And I just thought, you know, that is all fine, I guess. But, you know, when we talked to Mr. Moore, it was a very different understanding of how the planning department, Mr. Moore and the planning board and the zoning subcommittee are working together. So that seems important to me to put in. So, I didn't expect to put that in there. I just saw it as very important. But I really do think people should be comfortable with it um, and not vote on something they don't know. The other thing is, is that minutes are supposed to help people who are, like for people who aren't the meeting should understand what, what was said. And so I know we have different views on that, but it seemed to me most of the things I put in were important things that people said. So that's all I have to say. But I do think we should postpone until everyone's read it. Thank you. Doug, I still see your hand up. I don't know if, if you still want to speak or just No, talk. I, I should put it down. I will do that now. Okay, thank you. Um, so Chris, can we do that? Chris Bestrup, are you there? We can't hear you. Is your volume, is your mic turned on? I just turned it on. Um, right. So you what would you like us to do in, include the um edited minutes in your next packet um i think everybody should review uh the added comments um this is hard because we're talking about oh, two and a half months ago i mean i can barely remember sometimes in COVID what i ate yesterday um so that's why i did go back to the video but everybody should look and like Michael said, I mean, if it's what you're saying, as long as you're comfortable with it, but if you want to make edits, send them to Chris and Pam. Um, and if you have any concerns about what was added, um, like I have a couple just because I watched the video that I will send. So if you could incorporate those and then reissue them, and then hopefully we can get these passed uh, mm -hmm. at the next meeting. Does that sound okay, Chris? Sure. Yep. And if anyone has a problem or I forgot something, raise your hand and I'll call on you. I, whoop, yeah, I see Michael. I think we ought to make a point, make it clear that those, there ought to be a deadline on those submissions to Chris. Good, good, good. Yep, yep, calendar. Good point, Michael. Um, Chris, how about, well, how about we just do it by next Wednesday? I mean, let's just do it while it's, I mean, I'm joking saying, well, it's fresh in our minds. Um, how about by next Wednesday, you have to get the comments to Chris. Please review them and let's really try to do it so that we're not here two weeks from now and like, oh, I still haven't looked at them. Mm -hmm. um, good, all right. I think we can move forward. I don't see any hands. Um, so I'll move to item two, public comment period. This is, uh, okay, this is where Pam and I work together here. Um, this is where People, uh, the public can call in or zoom in and give a comment on something that is not on our agenda tonight, something different. So um, you'll have opportunity to speak later. I'm looking, you'd have to click your raise hand and I'm not seeing any. And Pam, I'm checking with you that we, do we have anyone on phone calls right now or? We have someone on phone call, but they are not requesting to speak. Great, okay. I think we got that great. So we will move on, thank you. So we're going to go to public hearings, site plan review. Uh, it's um, 6.52, so we can open um, our first public hearing. So in accordance uh, with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR-C. 2020-08-Russ Wilson, 11 Vista Terrace, Apple Wood Cluster Subdivision. Request 
site plan review approval to amend SPR-Z 2017-14 to add a three season room to an existing house, 16 by 20 feet, with a fireplace, screen clear poly movable panels, floor decking, frame roof with asphalt shingles, including a wooden walkway to connect to an existing wooden deck, map 25B-76R-LD zoning district. So hearing is open. First thing I'm gonna ask, I'm looking at for hands. Are there any board member disclosures? Oh, oh nope, hands going up. Uh, I don't see any board members saying they have a disclosure, but I do see Chris Bestrup has her hand up. I recognize Chris Bestrup. So um, I just wanted to mention that the person who's here as an attendee uh, on the phone is Russ Wilson. Okay. So um, he would be a good person to recognize now and have him make his presentation. And then Pam will probably have to tell him to hit star nine, I guess. Is that right? Um, yes. I just allowed him to speak. Can he, here he is down here. <laughs> Okay. Russ, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. And we, we can, can hear, hear you. you. Welcome. Oh. Oh, thank you. Welcome. If you could just introduce yourself. Um, I'm Russ Wilson. I'm a building contractor doing a small subdivision cluster development down in South Amherst. Uh, I'm a contractor working for Paul Cole, who owns it. Um, the house that we're talking about, uh, we're looking to put on a three season room. It will be on piers. It'll be a, basically a deck with screening under the deck, um, posts going up to the roof. And in between the posts will be a combination of very tough poly panels and screen uh, the poly panel to be able to move up and down um, in sections. Um, the, it will be a cathedral ceiling with uh, pine paneling on the ceiling, a couple skylights attached to the house. It will create a couple valleys up on the roof. Um, and then we'll be putting a deck connecting the new three season room to the existing deck. Sounds uh, it's lovely. A, it's a, it will be. Um, we originally designed it as a freestanding unit, and uh, the owner was talking to her sister, and her sister uh, pretty much insisted it, it get attached to the house, that it would get a lot more use. And I think from the, you probably have the 3D drawings and so forth, one of which is from in the house looking out into the three-season room, and it definitely pulls you out toward it. It does. It looks beautiful. And um, this is this kind of thing doesn't usually come to us, but it's coming to us, I believe, and Chris Bestrup can confirm this. Uh, it was part of the conditions, the record of decision for the subdivision. Uh, the second one, the condition says the applicant should return to the planning board for approval at the public meeting if there are any significant changes to the footprints of the building. So I'm assuming it's a three season porch, but this is expanding the footprint. And that's why you're here asking for the site plan review. Correct. Okay. And hopefully at, after this hopeful approval, we will then go and uh, have the, the wording changed so we don't have to come and do this every time somebody wants to add on to one of these houses. That makes sense. Um, Okay, if you don't have anything to add at this time, um, I'm going to go and ask for um, one of the members who attended the site visit. I don't know if that was discussed, if someone was willing to do it, or if they want to raise their hand. Michael. Oh, Michael. Michael's it. Uh, uh, yeah, five members of the uh, planning board were at the, uh, site, at the site plan visit. Um, and we saw uh, at the back of the house, the house uh, fronts on the uh, on Vista Drive there on the back of the house, uh, a uh, neatly staked out area which showed what the footprint would be like uh, for the proposed addition uh, and how it would connect to the existing house and to the existing deck on the, uh, 
uh, what it would be, I guess, the west side of the addition, um, and observed uh, the relationship of the addition, proposed addition, to the back uh, of uh, lot line and to the side lot line. And um, uh, that's about what we saw. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'll open it up to um, the board if they have any specific questions to ask the applicant or Ms. Bestrup. And I'm watching for hands here, scrolling. I don't see any hands raised. I mean, this is pretty straightforward. Um, so at this point, I'll ask the public. So I'm switching to the attendees to see if there's any hands raised here, if there's anyone who wants to ask a question or make a comment about this. I see nothing. Um, so at this point, there's nothing for the applicant to respond to. So we're moving to final comments um, and questions. Chris, um, do you have anything to add or can we move to make a motion here? Uh, yes. I just wanted to say that I received a nice phone call today from um, a Mr. Jacques who lives on uh, West Street and he, his property is directly adjacent to this property. And he said he and his wife are fine with what is being proposed. His only hope is that they don't have any loud parties. <laughs> Unless they're invited. That's right. <laughs> and it won't be till after COVID. So um, that's nice. Thank you, Chris. Is there anything else that we need to acknowledge or we're not really dealing with the, con um, the condition right now. We're just doing this SPR and now we're going to uh, uh, vote on it. Yeah, I did, I did send you information about um, the lot area and building coverage and lot coverage. And that all looks good. And I sent you some suggested conditions and one finding. Oh, great. This so is I can read those if you want me to. If you start reading, then I can take over. Let me just, I'm logging in to pull it up on my other computer. Yep, go ahead. Okay, go so ahead. the suggested conditions are oh, number one, the three season room and wooden walkway shall be built substantially in accordance with the plans submitted to the planning board and approved on X date. Number two, the three season room and wooden walkway shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on X date. And then the finding is the usual generic finding. The board finds that the proposal meets all of the rele relevant requirements of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw. That seems very straightforward. Um, I do see two hands at this time. Chris, I see, uh, I recognize Dave. I don't know what order you came in, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna recognize David and then Michael next. Hi, thank you. Um, the, the, the suggestion of um, expediting future site plan reviews for changes of footprints makes sense, makes, was, was suggested yesterday, it makes sense to me. Um, however, in thinking about it, this one lot in the cluster subdivision somewhat is somewhat unique from the other lots in the space that it has to expand its footprint. And so I'm a, while, while wanting to be efficient and effective for the developer and for the board, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm a, also a little bit concerned about about having a blanket approval for changes to the plans as previously submitted because the other lots did not have the same kind of lot coverage and, fr and frontage and side setbacks as this lot. And so, and so I'm re a much more ambivalent about, about the blanket approval um, for subsequent changes than I had been yesterday looking at this one site plan. And so that, 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 that's all what that's worth. Um, some good points, um, David. I just uh, want to say that we're not voting on that right now. That would be something in the future. Um, and it could be handled. Uh, have we handled a lot of things now? It sort of goes through like, uh, the building commissioner or, you know, the director of planning and they could make a judgment call that can be sort of written in I, there, I, you know. I agree. I agree. Uh, this was just 
on that yeah. second future further point. That's all. Great, great. And I'm sure Chris took that down. She's nodding her head. So, um, Michael, you're, oh, well, first I'll just, Chris, do you want to speak to that? Is that Yes, I wanted to okay. say that if um, if the applicant wants to change the conditions of the previous site plan review, they would file a request to amend the previous site plan review to um, allow future changes to be made. And the way it might be approved is that um, things would come to the planning board for the for at a public meeting, so they wouldn't go through the public hearing process, and then the planning board would make a determination about whether the change is big enough to require them to go through a whole site plan review process. So that's probably what I would recommend, but that's not part of what you're reviewing tonight. That would be for a future um, application. Thank you, Chris. I'm gonna go back to Michael now. Uh, yes, I'd like to move to uh, close the public hearing and approve the plans as proposed with the conditions and findings that Ms. Brestrup uh, mentioned a moment ago, attached. Someone want to raise a hand to second that? I, I see a physical hand of David being raised and Doug's. All right. Thank you. Um, so now are there any other questions, uh, comments from the board? Uh, does the applicant feel he needs to say anything? Because I can't see your face. So we're doing this sort of. Um, um, no, I don't, I don't feel like I need to say anything at this point. OK, great. Um, and I see no hands, so if we're ready to take a vote, um, I see no hands, we can do a roll call. So I will start with, and I had my list and then I moved it. Well, I can start, with, oh, here we go, Michael. I think that was a yes. You got a little chopped up there on my side here. Uh, yes, I approve. Okay, great. Um, Maria? Yes, approved. Okay, great. Uh, Jack? Yes. David? Approved. Doug? Yes. Janet? Yes. And I also say yes, approved, so that's unanimous. Um, seven will move forward. Great, thank you very much. Good luck, it looks beautiful. I, I'm looking forward to the parties. All right. Well, thank you very much. It really does look beautiful. Thank you for um, coming. Thank you. Okay, so Good panelists, night. now we we'll move night. on to the next thing. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> so weird. All I see is just like the picture of a phone. So. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Okay, so um, that's done. We're going to move on to reopening an old hearing. I'm just looking at my going through the paperwork. May, okay. May I interrupt so, for a minute? Excuse me. Yes. Christine, oh, manager. thank you. When I'm looking down, I can't see. I'm looking for um, Nate. And if Pam can he, find Nate, that'd be great. You're looking for what, Nate? Chris? Nate Malloy. Uh, I'm he's, here now. He's, he's there. I, I just is. moved him in. <laughs> There he is. Okay, because I didn't want to have to give the presentation. Thank you, Nate. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. No, I, I've been I've been an attendee listening. Sorry. Yes, I saw you hiding in there. Wait a minute, I lost okay. my screen. There we go. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. So, um, are there slides for for this, Pam? Do you have those? Yeah, I, I was going to share my. <laughs> I was going to share my screen. Um, are we ready You're, for that? Or? Okay. Yes, I'm good. You can pull that up on as I read the uh, open up the hearing again. Okay, so it is now 707 in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A. This public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and uh, is being continued from the planning board meeting of May 6th. This hearing is being held for the purpose of providing an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2020-07, Town of Amherst, East Pleasant Street, Kendrick Park Playground. 
request to approve or approval, request approval to construct a playground, walkways, seating areas, and other site improvements for a public park under section 3.335 of the zoning bylaw map 11C-244RG zoning district. Uh, so since we already had um, the first public hearing two weeks ago, we're gonna go right to the applicant's presentation. So I can see that we're trying to, what is going on right, here? I, oh, uh, yeah. mm, they're me? in the process of sharing, I think. <laughs> can everyone see it? I can it's see it. I see Nate it. Malloy. Uh, I can barely hear you, we Nate. Can, I can hear you, Nate. And right now I'm seeing half of an agenda and launching Zoom. So oh, whatever good. you're looking at, Pam, is not what we're seeing, I think. I have the, I have the, uh, huh. the colored I'm screen seeing. schematic. Uh, up. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so should I, uh, is it, Nate, is it you driving right now or is it Pam? It's Nate. I thought it was Nate, me. you want me to try and share it from... Uh, so it's... So I mean, um, I, let me stop sharing and then I can resume it. So what do people see now? Just I see, I see half of an finished, agenda. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I see I agree. Uh, so let launching... Me, yeah, this is... This is not me, good. I'm sharing... I tr I've launched it again. So there should be a colored uh, schematic, you know, a plan. Is that visible mm -hmm. to people? I have that. That's what I see. Yes. I, I see can that. see it. Someone up there, Mike. Oh. I can see it too. Christina, it doesn't sound like ten. Okay. No, because uh, sounds like I've been most people can see around. It. Christina, oh, so this what is do you see? Hold on here. I see nothing, but give me a second here. It looks like you're freezing up, Christy. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna so come back her. in. I'll be right back. No, no, it's okay. okay. I'll just, I'm just gonna pop out and then pop back in. All right, see you in a minute. All right, I guess we'll wait for the, uh, the discussion until Christine comes back. We've lost our leader. <laughs> Still here. I'm trying to like get out of this thing. Uh, I'm telling you, we're going to be Zoom experts by the end of this. We don't seem to be like that now. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is. Someone could just email Christine that image. No, I'm, I'm good. Hold on. Can other members of the planning board see the image? I can see the image. I can see it. I, I can. can. I, I see a colored schematic right. with. Okay, yep. I think I fixed it. I see it. I'm fixing everything so I have my things back. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yes. And, and Good. See you. Okay. So, Who Nate, you're, you're up. And... Sure. Sure. Great. Thanks, everyone. The, um, I'll walk through this plan. And then uh, we also um, went to the Design Review Board earlier this week. Um, and I can talk about their comments. And so, you know, if we're, if you can see the, my cursor, you know, the, the play area, someone called it ochre. I'm not sure how it looks on your screens, but this area hasn't changed much. What has changed is heading north. So north is to the right. You know, we had talked about the plans last time, there was a, a rough sketch and then the plans actually showed a hillside slide up here with some topography and really what what's happened is we've, we've eliminated any hillside slide and we've made this pathway that, that, that is essentially at grade to create an accessible loop 
you know, a walkway that connects here. So you know, this becomes a nice accessible path. Uh, there is a, still a bit of a hill here. So there's still the amphitheater in the hillside with, with seating and the rock stage area. As you move further north, there's uh, some planting beds in these circles here that connect across the path. These are vertical stumps that are in the ground. This grass area is actually um, earth, you know, uh, they're mount, it's mounded uh, grass. So, you know, like three to four foot high mounds, there's two or three of them in here. So it's some, an undulating surface that would be sawed. As you come over here to this part of the, of the pathway system, there's some seeding. Uh, and then this darker area, this is actually a keystone, um, loose keystone gravel area for kids to play in in lieu of a sandbox with some seating around it. Um, and then one other big change that's happened is this area with the circles. This is all, these are all vertical logs. Here's logs that are on their side that would be staked into the ground. But this whole area now to the east of this um, play area is a naturalized play area with wood fiber. There'll be stumps and rocks and logs in there. So this area will, you know, there'll be a connection from the manufactured play area uh, to here to the gravel area. So this becomes, you know, a really um, integral part of the playground design. And uh, what's not shown here on the plans is we're considering, you know, two picnic tables or a few picnic tables that would be located in this area. If we look around the plan, um, things shown in, I'll say it's like pink, those are stone seating walls or stone uh, blocks, but all, you know, 18 to 22 inches high that would be used for seating. And um, if we're looking along this western boundary along North Pleasant, we have, you know, um, an arrangement of sit sitting walls, benches here in brown, and then plantings and then sitting blocks and plantings, uh, boulders, and then a sitting wall. But you know, this is really uh, forming a natural barrier rather than a fence and it also offers sitting opportunities. Um, there's, um, you know, if we keep, continue around, there's more stone sitting and then there's benches. There's a total of five or six benches, a number of stone areas to sit. Uh, the benches range in, from six to eight feet in length. They'll all have backs and arms, and I'll show an image later. Um, and they may have arms in the middle too for helping people uh, get up and down. This, um, this sitting area, this plaza area, um, you know, at the last um, hearing, there was a suggestion if, if it could be made much bigger. Um, if, it's hard to see, but there's an existing really mature tree with its, with its um, canopy coming in here. And so we're already encroaching within the drip line of the tree. So we're really trying to minimize and save that it. it's a 30 inch maple. So we're already encroaching a little bit underneath it. And uh, there was a decision, you know, not to make this too much bigger also because of topography. So in lieu of really enlarging the sitting area, the idea is having some picnic tables that could be placed around the walkways. Um, as we move further east here, again, just as a East Pleasant Street is down here, the idea is to have planting beds, um, boulders are shown in orange, and the agility area that has stumps and logs to create another natural barrier for fencing and for visual interest and for sitting. The, um, um, there's only three trash cans here. There's one at the main entrances and one up here at the north. The idea is that, you know, there'll be, um, they'll look like the, the trash cans downtown will be half recycling and half trash. The, um, this walkway as shown in the gray, this is the east-west walkway and it will be illuminated. There's some um, light poles shown along the walk here. There's four or five of them. So this becomes, you know, a sidewalk that is maintained year round. Um, there's also plans to run conduit. There's a number of possibilities of putting light posts further into the park. And so as part of this project, we're gonna run conduit with the anticipation at some time that maybe there'll be some light posts further in the play area. That's not happening now. For the light posts going along this walkway, um, we're gonna reuse some existing lighting from downtown. So the acorn style lights that are in downtown. And when, uh, if there's a plan for another lighting um, 
design within Kendrick Park or this area of downtown, we would just swap out the light posts and the, you know, and the headlights, the lantern pieces. But for now, we're, we reuse what is um, seen downtown. Um, I think uh, one thing, you know, this, this design does really respond to, there's a lot of existing trees. So some of this um, circular paths or, you know, the, this shape, this pattern is really working with existing trees and topography. Um, and it was also decided that keeping this mostly at grade allows for future connections to the north or across the park um, a lot more easily than having, you know, a mound with a, with a slide. Uh, that became an expensive option once we started talking to vendors and it wasn't really, you know, it may have only been a four foot long slide and it would need to be on concrete posts with rubberized surface around it and it just wasn't as nice of a, um, an implementation as an idea. So I think, you know, if you went online and if you Googled hillside slide, you might see some really great images, but we really didn't have the height or the, you know, the space to make something that you'd see online. Um, when we went to the design review board this week, they asked about having some demarcation in this play area of, of a walkway. And so this whole area in, in, well, I don't know if it's yellow or orange on your screen or, anyways, this is all rubberized and that's because it's, um, the, some of the play equipment, the fall zones come within what would be if there was a five foot walkway, but it's, it's easy enough with this surface to have different colored treatment. And so we would have an offset here to show a five to six foot walkway around the perimeter of this area to match the width of this walkway. So, you know, it'd still be a rubberized surface um, and it's, you know, only um, equipment is not right in this area, but, you know, that way it indicates that there is a, a continuous walkway that connects to the east-west path. So that's something that would be a visual cue that someone could walk through here. And, you know, it's, it's rubberized, so it's accessible, it's smooth, it's, you know, all these, there's no lips or, or steps here. Uh, it's, it's a pretty seamless transition between materials. I'm going to start another presentation just showing the amenities that we'd have on the site. So um, this is the style of bench we're looking at. It's not necessarily the color, but this is, you know, it's an all metal bench with arms and there could be a middle arm. The idea is that they'd be set either on, um, you know, on concrete or there'd be footings, you know, concrete footings underneath just the feet of the bench. But this is the style bench. If I, mean, I can make this a little smaller if it's, I don't know how, if how visible that is. Um, within the plaza area, the round table and chairs, this is, again, the style we'd have uh, for an accessible table with chairs, you know, just be missing one, um, one, one chair, but, you know, it's all one piece. Uh, but here's the type of trash can that we have downtown. So it's a, it's a 40 gallon trash can with half recycling, half trash. And for the picnic tables, um, I guess there's a trash can twice, but the picnic tables, it's something similar to this. It's an, you know, all one piece. We would probably get flat seats and a flat top and it would be all metal. Um, you can get it in recycled plastic or have wood components, but we're looking at getting all metal. For durability, um, these could be staked into the ground um, and they'd be, you know, six to eight feet in length. The colors we're looking at are, um, there's three colors. The, the company offers probably about, you know, 18 different colors. Most of them are quite bright, um, you know, or it's like silver, metallic, and black. So we're looking at either a, like a Carlsbad, Sudan, or Juniper Green, but um, they're, you know, muted color. We've asked for additional images with these, um, just to confirm if we like them in those bench styles and table styles, but, you know, it'd be something that would be not too dark to attract the heat and nothing too, um, you know, too off putting like a bright red or a bright blue or green, which they do offer. And, you know, maybe if in a thematic park, that would be fine, but that's not what we're asking for here. So there is, you know, this style, this, these color options. Um, one thing just to, it was in the plan set, I'm just calling out separately. There's this little planter island here. Um, it also serves the purpose of holding a welcome sign. And, you know, the idea would be that it, complies with the zoning, so it would not exceed 12 square feet. It would be three feet by four feet or four feet by three feet. Um, we're looking at having it, um, you know, a two-sided sign that is set between four by four stone pillars. 
the, um, you know, there's a great comment at the design review board to acknowledge the CPA funding. We also have to acknowledge the park grant and, um, you know, also the, um, the playground. On the back side would be rules and regulations. And, you know, I, I've heard from the vendors that we also need to have um, some signs describing kind of the safety of the equipment, which they provide, which could be mounted on the back of the sign. So there's, you know, it really would be a two-sided sign. I think I've showed this before, but this is again, just showing what we'd be considering for the stone seating. So this is, you know, what could be actually the stone, the square stone blocks. Here's the type of stone uh, sitting wall that would be around the amphitheater and on parts of the walkway. And when we're looking at, you know, placing boulders around certain parts of the edges, uh, and here's P stone. So you can see how, you know, this type of material would interact and how stones interact along an edge. For the grass mounds, we really are considering something, you know, maybe not quite this big, maybe closer to this picture, but, you know, having a few of these on that north area in place of the hillside slide. So it would be, you know, an area with natural grass and something that, um, you know, kids can, can play on and roll around in. I think, as you mentioned, the logs, you know, the naturalized area now is quite, is, is, is bigger and we'd have, you know, about eight inches of a wood fiber on the ground we'd have logs that could be stacked up a little bit. They'd all be secured to the ground with threaded rod. Um, you know, so they'd be anchored with a rod that goes into the ground. Um, and people could sit on them or climb on them. This, these are images of Pulaski Park. And so these logs are over here in the image. Here's some wood, they used some wood fiber. And then here are the vertical logs. And so, you know, we're gonna have a similar element, um, you know, in, the, in connecting the different areas of the play area. In terms of the manufactured equipment, um, you know, we're still keeping um, some of these major elements. We, we met with the, the vendor today and, you know, this is an accessible spinner, which we like, you know, it's at grade and it can hold the number of people, um, you know, the colors are, can be changed. So we've asked for a different color palette, but, um, you know, th these two play structures, this is a pretty large play structure for uh, five to 12 year olds. This is two to five. We've asked for a different roof material here, um, a metal roof, um, but we like the idea of having a roof here to provide some shade. Uh, this is a spinner. We've asked for a different type of rocker here, not something that looks like a tractor. And um, to the north where the walkways are, right now there are, you know, they've shown two, um, two musical drums and we've asked for, um, you know, different types of, um, you know, something at grade that can be used, uh, something that maybe moves or is mechanical. And so they were looking at, you know, possibly a sundial or some other things. But uh, what's nice about this is it's outside the, um, the fall zone of this equipment. And if it's at grade, it can also be accessible. So we're looking at some features there. This is just other views of the equipment. Um, you know, there is a lot of, e and each, each one of these structures offers, you know, each, you know, each has a, um, a climbing wall, a few slides, a net or overhead climbers that people can use, places to sit underneath and on top. And um, so, you know, we've asked for just a few, you know, modifications to these structures, but not a lot. Um, you know, we do like the idea that there's many different play elements. And we think that changing some of the color palettes will lessen the kind of the uh, you know maybe the fact that it, that it is manufactured we're not trying to go with a synthetic or faux looking tree trunks um, that's cost prohibitive and I, I think we think it would actually look worse um, and I think that's it for now I mean there's a you know a detailed plan set I won't go through if there's questions I can use those um, but I think that's it for now um, Nate, if you could just, just to enhance something you were talking about, go to sheet five that shows the uh, grading excavation plan. Just, it has two mounds there. If you just, sure. you had said a yeah. few, but I see one is about five feet grade. Yeah. yeah and the other's like three. Yeah, right. So, you know, yeah, it, you know, it, it would, if you looked at it, there'd be, you know, a little hill, hill like this, you're if you're following my mouse, and then, you know, another hill here. Right. So there is two, just two, um, and I think, you know, the slopes are three to one in there. I think there was a four to one. So they, you know, they are 
you know, if they're too much steeper, they won't support um, grass and mm -hmm. it could get dangerous. So we're keeping that, um, these here. So that's why the bigger one is like five feet and the one, the small one is only like three feet. Three feet, right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, a five foot hill, I mean, it's still, I think that would still be pretty fun for kids to play on. Oh, when you're two feet tall, that's a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up to board questions, so I'll be watching for hands. Um, if anyone has any questions on, on what we're being presented with and, and questions on the, on the new information that has come on these drawings. Um, so I see one hand so far. I see Janet, so I call on Janet, and I'll be watching for other hands. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right moment, but I was hoping that um, Nate could review the management plan quickly. If, if it might be later after the diagrams, I just wanted to hear that. Geez, it's we have a core of volunteers who are going to be out there every day. <laughs> um, no, I think you know we we said it was. Um, you know, there had been a lot of questions about maintenance of this, um, of the park. And so, you know, I will say that the plantings we're looking at, if we, if I go back to this plan, um, and there were some questions about the plantings. And so there's a mix of ground cover, um, um, small trees and shrubs, and then some, you know, we're planting some, uh, what would be become shade trees. And, you know, we're working with Alan Snow, the tree warden and other, and Paul Dethier and Barb Bills. And we're looking at, um, far from LSC, but we're looking at, you know, plants that are once established are pretty tolerant of conditions. So, you know, the thought would be that they don't need a lot of maintenance or water and they're pretty hardy in terms of both climate and um, use by the public. In terms of maintaining the park, you know, DPW goes around daily to the parks and opens them up, um, you know, does some uh, trash pickup and you know just does a quick inspection a visual inspection of places so it would be a similar routine and then you know there's weekly mowing or or other maintenance you know the idea is that the park would not be would be open seasonally um you know we wouldn't be paving anything other than this walkway in the winter so you know this becomes you know essentially closed in the off season it's um you know for now there's no lighting so it would be open just dawn till dusk um and so you know there's a some daily work and then weekly work. And then, you know, at every park, there's seasonal um, kind of start up and close up. And then sometimes like a mid season um, uh, work day, you know, where there's, you know, they, there's a little more in depth cleaning or, you know, if there's capital uh, work that needs to be done, capital improvements, they do that. So I think it's kind of daily, you know, there's chores weekly and then uh, seasonally. Uh, Nate, just to, put it in a bigger perspective, we've got some other things. I know you're familiar with golf park and that's progressing and there's a dog park and we have other playgrounds. So this park would just become part of a larger management plan, I'm assuming, that Alan Snow and, and the DPW, they may have to maintain all of these things, so. They, they do, right, right. And I think, you know, I, I think, I, I don't know if I mentioned it last time, but you know, I think there's an awareness that as the town makes improvements to the outdoor spaces, whether it's for recreation or conservation and on other parks, passive recreation active, you know, there, there may need to be a budget increase. Um, you know, there is seasonal staff and then there's, um, um, you know, um, permanent staff at public works that maintain um, parks. And so, yeah, I think if this becomes part of their rotation, I think, um, you know, I, like I said, I think once everything, I think for the first year, you know, there's going to be some watering and there'll be a little bit more effort to establish the park. But once things, once, you know, the plants and vegetation are growing, um, there really shouldn't be much uh, maintenance. The playground equipment is, you know, supposed to be durable and the, the surfacing is supposed to be all good for, you know, I don't want to say, you know, they'll, they'll say 25 years. I don't know if it lasts that long, but, you know, everything is really meant to be, you know, maintenance free in terms of large capital needs for, you know, at least 10, 15 years. Thank you. Um, I do see Maria. I'm going to call on Chris first and then Maria. So we did, as I said uh, previously, we did um, do this plan with Alan Snow, the tree warden, who's also in charge of parks maintenance, and Paul Dethier, who's on the staff of the DPW. He's a landscape architect and an engineer. And so they have a, you know, a sensitivity about maintenance issues. 
We also, um, I remember last time Janet asked a question about watering. And so we did ask that question and Guilford Mooring, the superintendent of public works said that they may install a hydrant here um, where someone could, you know, make a connection and um, have a hose and water things. They also have a water truck that they can bring around. Um, and according to Alan Snow, he thought that the plantings would really need watering during the first year, but um, since they are hardy and uh, a lot of native plants, um, he felt that after the first year of watering that they would be um, pretty self-sufficient. So I just wanted to let you know that we had looked into that. Thank you, Chris. I recognize Maria. Oh, uh, there you okay. Um, first, I just want to say that uh, I think that this design by committee and all these. Oh, I'm sorry about oh, that. Geez. <laughs> this is my iPad I'm trying to use instead of my laptop. Um, the design by multiple you know, groups and committees has been really successful. I, I hope this is a model for like how other public projects can happen because it really seems like you've taken the feedback and um, incorporated it. And I really like the multiple seating options because this is a really sort of community building space. And um, it's not just for the kids, obviously it's for the parents and anyone, you know, to come and just sit and mingle. And so um, I think I, it, I, I think you've added a lot more seating from the last time we saw it. Um, so I really appreciate that. And the um, uh, only question I had was maybe it's not worth talking about now, but or maybe I missed it, but what is this little, this little art display parallelogram you have on the south? Did you already discuss that or did I miss it? No, I think when, um, when there was the art installation at Kendrick Park. Um, hey, can you put the mouse on it so people sure, know? I'm sorry, yeah, it's further, it's not within our yeah. project scope, but there's yeah. this area here. Um, I don't know if everyone can see that it's, it's to the, you know, it's to the south or, you know, to the left on the screen. Uh, you know, there has been some consideration for public art. There had been some discussion, you know, of trying to have a space within this sitting area, which originally there was this little um, area here, which we've removed, but we've always considered that there could be spaces along the edge for, for, for display of public art. I think this one is, um, is there because when there was the outdoor sculpture, um, there was, you know, there was a few pieces that were put in the park. And so this is an area that works um, for having a piece. So that's something there. Um, something off of what Maria said, I want to double that, that I do think uh, I see extra seating and, and I want to, one of the people who was concerned that the only table eating area is that uh, circular um, mm -hmm. section to the uh, west. So I was really glad to hear, Nate, when you were saying that you were considering putting picnic tables um, by that 30 inch maple in the dead center, um, you know, because I, I do you know, we hope that it will be used and people will come and, and be hanging out and spending the day and picnicking and letting their kids play. So yeah, uh, okay. I thought that was a good fix for that. Yeah, I think the idea would be to use, um, have two picnic tables, two eight foot tables to start. And then, you know, Alan and everyone agree that if, it, if you know, this becomes a really popular destination, it's, it's you know, we can add more. Um, that sounds great, thanks. And I was also glad to see the, the bike racks. That's great, the bike lockup. So um, I am gonna recognize Chris in case she has a comment and then I see Michael. So I just wanted to mention that Nate and I actually had a Zoom meeting with some um, interested pub men members of the public who have been following this project. And um, you know, one of them was really hoping that we could incorporate some playground equipment that she had seen in Europe. And um, Nate did make an effort to find out about some of that equipment and, um, you know, Europe, European um, accessibility requirements and liability issues and different things like that um, make it difficult for us to incorporate those kinds of um, play equipment here. It may be possible in the future to incorporate some of those as, um, you know, our manufacturers look over there and see what they're doing and try to, you know, adapt it to us. But I just wanted to let you know that we did reach out and we had a, I thought it was a very good conversation with three 
um, people who have been following this project all along who had feelings about wanting more natural play equipment and more European style equipment. Um, I think that they, I came away from the meeting feeling like they understood, you know, that we were trying to balance things. We wanted to make sure that the equipment was safe and that it would withstand liability issues and that it was handicapped accessible. But at the same time, we are um, providing this agility area to the uh, east um, or down at the bottom of the of what you see as a colored plan just kind of balance out and make people feel like um, there are natural features here that that children can play with so I just wanted to let you know that we we didn't um, not hear those people we heard what they were saying and we tried to incorporate some of their ideas to the extent possible and it may be possible in the future to put other features in as the park develops um, further. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, you know, Chris's point, I think, sorry, I just want to jump in right now. No, there. go ahead. <laughs> All right, one was, um, I, I can't see everyone. One was a ground level trampoline, um, which may, um, you know, if you go online, you can, um, you know, uh, some of the images um, were from Berlin and there's some abroad and they do look like fun. So the vendor said the, the um, the compliance engineer had said that the you know the U.S. and this is looking at it, but right now it doesn't meet the standards, and he thought it could be a year or two away. And so he listed a number of things of why it you know wouldn't necessarily be they couldn't they wouldn't install it now. So I don't we couldn't find a vendor who would install it. Um, and one another one that was a nice suggestion, which we you know may or may not happen in this phase, but it, it, I'm going to share a new share was um, outdoor ping pong tables. Mm -hmm. People can see these now; they can be made out of concrete. Um, Portland has a number of them and, um, you know, certain, uh, and I guess um, there are, you know, they are, there are a number of cities that have them. So that was a nice suggestion. And so it's, it's, um, you know, we had it, we haven't, you know, if we haven't necessarily incorporated it into the design, it was just mentioned today, but that's another um, feature that could be um, installed later or, you know, part of, you know, uh, incorporated into Kendrick Park as a whole. So if it's not within this play area, we like the idea of having some other features that could be, um, you know, incorporated into all of Kendrick Park. So that's something that we, you know, we're, we're taking under consideration. Great, thanks. Uh, Michael, and then next will be David. Uh, yeah, I wanna echo uh, my appreciation for the way the process has evolved, for the, the, the project has evolved through all kinds of different inputs. I think that's been excellent. Uh, and particularly with regard to the addition of more seating in the, uh, in the general area. Uh, and to uh, perhaps uh, go further than is our purview, I would like to suggest that the uh, picnic tables that uh, Nate showed the, with the rounded seats would, I think, be much more, uh, much better than the ones with the flat seats. Oh, okay, uh, because, yeah. the, because they would encourage people to be able to sit both directions on the picnic table, which often happens when you're in park life mm -hmm. settings. Oh, so I, I, would, I would urge you to not go for the flat ones, but go for the curved ones. Oh, no, sure, that's, that, I, think, I think the project is exceptional. Oh, great, thanks. So the rounded seats, I, that's, um, that's good feedback. It's funny. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, you have something in mind and you're not, you know, not sure what works better, but that's a, I, I like that point about the rounded seats that it's probably actually more comfortable and then it facilitates different sitting options. Um, David. Hi, thank you. I, I'd like uh, again to commend Nate and the team and Chris for bringing this together and being as responsive as they have been. Uh, I would like, to, I would propose a motion to approve the uh, park, the presentation uh, and the, the proposal as presented with the design review board comments, um, the, the differentiation of the, the colors for the walkway around the play area and then the sign with the acknowledgement of the CPAC money. Um, thank you and thank you Nate for all the work that you've, you've put in to try to maximize the funding for and and maximize the play in downtown. Thank you, Michael. Are you seconding? I second the motion. Okay, I just, I think we can do that, but I have to open it up to public comment and just check for that. And then we'll come back to this. I don't know if we have to say it again, but 
let's we've got that there so at this time i'm going to ask if there's anyone of uh, the attendees that would like i just saw one pop up um i see one hand um so at this time and um pam is there anyone on the phone or is this all that i see okay. all all we see is miss pam okay so i'll recognize um dorothy pam hello can you hear me we can hear you hello well, I just want to say that it was extremely agile uh, of uh, Chris to have had that meeting today because I got a call email earlier in the afternoon about Karen Winter, who's really been following this and, to, and having suggestions and wanting to know how to get through the meeting. And I said, well, I don't think you're going to have a hand. I don't know. And she said, what about chat? I said, we've turned it off for Zoom bombers re reasons. And I guess you must have had to have had that meeting today, which I think is fabulous because um, when interested people have questions and they get a really good answer, then it, it keeps them happy. So I, I do applaud the changes that you've been making and I think this will be a great park. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, if the, uh, now I see Karen Winter's hand, I recognize her. Karen, oh, you're still muted. Pam, are you undoing her? Okay. okay. I just wanted to thank Dorothy for, um, for being so accessible and the whole committee. You've really been open and gone out of your way to hear me. Um, and I'm also impressed with the way you've, you've followed up on all this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, at this time, these are the only um, hands up I see. Uh, Dorothy's hand is still up. Right. I'm put it down. I think. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll go back to um, us and I see Chris's hand up. I recognize Chris and then I do see Michael's hand up, but yeah, Chris. So I wanted to um, just make a note that there were some conditions that were sent to you, some yes. uh, proposed conditions um, built substantially in accordance with the plans, managed substantially in accordance with the management plan, and then the usual one about landscaping um, shall be installed in accordance with the planting plan and once installed shall be continually maintained. And then um, I wasn't sure if you wanted us to come back once we have um, a complete idea of what we're doing with the equipment. So you could add a fourth condition um, stating that once we have finalized the equipment choices that we would come back and show them to you at a public meeting. I'm going to ask the board members, it, uh, well, Michael, can you put your hand down for a sec and then I'll come back to you. I just want to ask board members, um, does, raise your hand if you want playground structure to come back to us or if you're good with the planning department and the DPW at this point selecting it. So raise your hand if you want it to come back to planning board. One, two, three. I don't see any hands, so I think we're good, Chris. Um, I think we've seen enough. So I'll go back to Michael. You had your hand up. Only uh, to continue the second, if that was <laughs> relevant. Okay. Um, so we do have a motion on the table and it's been seconded, seconded and we've done public comment. Um, is there anyone at this time who has something else they'd like to say or add or comment? I don't see. Chris has oh, her hand. A physical hand. It's hard for me to watch both, Chris. <laughs> um, just um, that uh, to include um, the finding that this uh, plan meets all of the relevant requirements of Section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw. And does it, or do I need to pull that out? No, I think it does. Okay. So that and the conditions. That's part of the, that's part of the motion and the second yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. So at this point, I think we can take a vote. Um, I'm still watching. So, um, so members, I'll call your name and um, uh, say yay or nay or abstain, please. So I'll start with Michael. Approve. And um, I'm going out of normal. Maria? Approve. Uh, Jack? 
Yes, approve. David? Approve. And um, Doug? Approved. And Janet? Approve. And I also approve, so that's unanimous, seven votes. So we're done with this hearing. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move on with our agenda. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna, Christine, I just wanna- yeah. Uh, oh yeah, and thank you, Nate. <laughs> well, yeah, I was gonna thank, um, you know, I think there's a, um, you know, Paul Dethier at DPW has been doing most of the design and really working with the team and um, incorporating the comments. So I think he and Alan really deserve, and you know, um, Shout out to Paul and especially Paul and also yep. Alan and all of the DPW staff, Gil, all the way up to Guilford, who's been working on this. Yeah. And Thank also you. Barb Bills yep. from the LSSC. She's been with us every step of the way. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's been a really nice collaborative effort. So thanks for all the comments and uh, yeah, thanks. I'll stop sharing my screen, Pam, and then I, I guess it'll go back to you. You can go. This is this has gone on for so long. I kind of can't even believe it's happening. I'm really excited. <laughs> okay, so right. Pam, do you want to put up uh, the master plan? We are going to go on to the master plan. Okay, so we'll move to um, item um, four. Whoops. Yep. Chris, do you want the document first, or do you want Ben's slides? Put the document first. All right, you got it. So I'm uh, moving to item four, master plan update. Christine Bestrup, planning director, report on the master plan update with a focus on chapter three, land use, followed by questions and comments from the planning board members. Uh, we won't at this time be taking public comment on this. This is more of our um, first run. We're just feeling out um, Christine Bestrup, the director of planning's first attempt at one chapter and feeling out the style and how it's being done and then um, depending on how that goes tonight we will uh, move to whoa things are changing here um, we'll move um, to the public process and how we're going to actually start doing this as different sections come out um, so chris is soon oh there it is great Okay, thank you, Pam. Um, so um, we have decided to um, update our master plan um, and do necessary and obvious changes. And um, that was determined by uh, a joint agreement of the planning board and the CRC, and I believe town council um, as well. So uh, that's the approach that we are taking. And um, there are actually two or maybe more parts to the master plan. The first part is the text, which everybody is familiar with. There are 10 chapters um, and the 10 chapters are, most of them, uh, the subject matter is defined by the state. The state tells us what we need to include in our master plan. Um, and then uh, the, the second part of it is um, a series of appendices. And the appendices provide additional information, existing conditions, et cetera, um, that relate to um, the, the topics that are in the chapters, in the text chapters. So when I first um, started uh, <clears throat> updating or you know, thinking about how I was gonna update the master plan, I was really focused on the text portion and wasn't thinking so much about the need to update the appendices, but I think um, now that we've really begun to get into it and have, um, you know, studied it, um, we realize that we do need to at least make some changes to the appendices. And one of the appendix appendices is um, appendix chapter six, which is called land use. So um, when, as I've been going through the text here of the land use section, and I should say I chose the land use section because it's really the section that I'm most familiar with. I mean, that's what um, the planning department is all about, land use. The other chapters having to do with economic development and housing and demographics and natural and cultural resources, we certainly uh, touch on those, but we're not as intimately involved in those topics as we are in 
um, the topic of land use. So I chose to go through the land use uh, section first and um, really just, you know, went through each paragraph and thought about, well, um, what have we done in the last 10 years in, in, uh, in terms of some of these topics? Now, um, so that my approach was to sort of in response to the notion that um, people will wonder, you know, members of the public are going to wonder, well, we had this master plan and did it just sit on the shelf or did we actually take actions um, in regard to what was recommended here? And I remember that came up when we met with um, town council and the CRC early on, like, well, what have you done with this? So um, going kind of step by step through it, I annotated uh, this chapter of the master plan to um, point out what we have done and to suggest uh, areas that we might do more. So I'll go through um, some. I don't know if, if you want me to go through all of the annotations, but I can go through some of them. Um, so with that said, uh, I did receive um, a response to, uh, we had sent out um, this section of the master plan to the planning board. Actually, I think we sent it out in March because we were supposed to uh, have this discussion on March 18th. And of course, everything was shut down on March 16th. So we couldn't um, have this discussion then. But I did receive a very thoughtful um, set of comments from Michael Burtwistle. I received them, well, I think he sent them late on Friday, this past Friday. Um, I believe that's when he sent them. Anyway, um, they, they were very thoughtful. He went through this um, really carefully and came back with a lot of thoughts. His, his approach would have been different from mine. It would have been actually simpler. And I didn't send his comments to you, but I think I will um, for the next time we discuss this. So the only set of comments aside from a few minor comments that I received from Christine Gray Mullen back in March, which I can tell you about. Um, so this was the set of comments that I received. His, Michael's approach would have been to not focus on what we've done in the past and really make this a more forward looking document. Um, just talk about what we're gonna do moving forward and not get into too much detail about what we have or haven't done. So that's, that's a different approach. And once you see Michael's comments, um, once I send them to you, you'll uh, understand that. And those would be included in the next packet when we, when we talk about the master plan. But going back to um, the way I approached it, it was really to try to you know, fill in some of the gaps in knowledge. Um, for instance, on the first page of the land use section, um, down at the bottom of the page, existing conditions. Well, um, the existing conditions uh, of the current master plan were really um, determined back in, um, I would say sometime between 2006 and 2010. Uh, that's when this master plan was written. So it was based on um, the GIS, the mass GIS and the town's GIS that were uh, existing at that time and it was much different from the from the GIS that we ha have today and for those of you who aren't familiar I'm sure you're all familiar with but GIS is geographic information systems it gives us a tremendous amount of information about what's down on the ground so um, what this um, master plan relied on was mass GIS from 1999 so that was really you know 20 years ago so um, not only has the condition on the ground changed, but the way of uh, measuring it, the way of mapping it, um, what to map, et cetera, has all changed. So when I asked um, our new planner, uh, Ben Brager, whom I'm, uh, I'm hoping that you will see more of him um, as he starts working for us full time, um, I asked him to work with the IT department to develop um, the new information about current land use patterns. And so what he found out was that it's really hard. He can come up with what is here today, but he has a hard time comparing it to what was here 
1999, because in some ways we're comparing apples to oranges. And we can talk about that later when we look at, at the information that he's given me. So, um, so that uh, is, you know, part of the introduction here is um, we're seeking updated information about our land use patterns, but it's going to be a mixed bag. And we're going to have to put in some sort of disclaimer about um, what information we had back then, what information we have now, and how it doesn't always um, mesh. So um, Pam, maybe you could move to the next page. Mm -hmm. um, and when we're talking about land consumption, here's, here's something that um, really Actually, this is a question that didn't really make much sense to me. Go back to the 3.2, I think it is. There we go. So uh, there was a statement here about um, the size of lots. And I'm not sure we care about that. Maybe we care about it, but maybe we don't care about it. This is a very confusing sentence to me. Since the year 2000, the total developed land area in Amherst that consists of residential lots larger than half an acre grew by 65%, while Amherst's population remained relatively stable. Maybe that's something that we want to know about, but it seems like a pretty obscure thing. I guess the idea here was that um, our population was, grow was, was not growing, but at the same time, we were eating up more land to house um, the same number of people. And I guess you know, you can see uh, some examples of that. If you look at some of the outlying subdivisions in town, there probably have bigger uh, land lot areas per house than, um, than we do in some of our inner um, subdivisions, but that may or may not be something that we care about. So, um, you know, I did make an annotation about that, but I'm not sure it's something that we're all that interested in. My, my observation was that most of the development in the last 20 years seems to have been um, in the downtown area and in some of our more developed places. In fact, um, we've experienced quite a bit of that since 2010. So um, I, I would be interested in having input from planning board members about what they think about that phenomenon. Um, the next paragraph, land preservation priorities. Um, we talk a lot about um, the rural landscape that we have and how we've protected a lot of it. Well, we do have some information about um, new, new protections that we've put on. Um, and again, we're seeking updates from the IT department and our staff. Um, increasing land values and affordability concerns. I don't know if I had anything to say about that. Um, and you can keep scrolling down, Pam, until you come to the next. Mm -hmm. So it says, if you say what um, section you're on, Chris, that will help us follow along too. Um, okay, section C, it's on this page that Pam is showing right now. On the need to protect community character, that's a pretty important one. People talk about that a lot. Um, Amherst has wonderful community character, and that's why a lot of people move here. Um, so my comment was that Amherst was currently exploring the concept of design guidelines through planning for housing production. We're really just doing that in the downtown area so far. We're working with a consultant on the Chapter 40R project, but I think that that may um, enlighten us about uh, design guidelines that we can use elsewhere. Um, so that's, in fact, what I said there. Lessons from this project will help inform efforts to amend the zoning bylaw and to incorporate design guidelines and form-based code. We don't necessarily have to go through Chapter 40R and adopt it in order to uh, learn from the design guidelines that are being presented to us. Um, need to revise zoning codes in the next uh, section. Um, well, we're all quite aware that we need to revise zoning codes. The zoning code was um, amended quite a bit after 2010, and that's what allowed more development downtown. Um, maybe we want to reconsider some of that and, um, you know, get a little bit more control of it, but that's something that uh, probably will be on our, on our uh, plate going forward. Um, so keep going, Pam. Yep. So what do we have here? Um, We've got some blue. Here. 
what is the topic here? I should be using, looking at my paperwork instead of looking at the scrolling screen. Um, so this um, topic is preferentially direct future development to existing built up areas. I think we're doing a pretty good job of that. Chris, can you just say like what section is it? L U, L U one B. Okay, thank you. That helps us so, follow on paper too. Um, and the uh, strategy is evaluate built-up areas on the basis of their character, quality, and priority, and then identify areas to do various things. Um, so at the bottom of that, um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but. Um, there was a comment about um, strengthening code inspections, revising existing rental registration regulations, and encouraging al alternative student housing efforts. I think the town has come a long way in the last 10 years in regard to that. We've really um, we've hired inspectors. We've uh, enforced our building code. We put in a rental registration program. Um, and I think we can all see that uh, the, the look of the town has improved vastly since 2010, um, and that's uh, partially because we had, um, oh my goodness, there was a task force that was set up to address safe and healthy neighborhoods. That was it. And I don't know if I mentioned that in particular here, but um, in my mind, I think it's important to tell people uh, what we've done to change things and make things better. So that's something I would be looking to you to tell me. Do you want that in the master plan or don't you want it in the master plan? Do you think that's um, history and you know we can just put it aside and go on to the next thing and um, looking forward or is it um, beneficial to point these things out to people? Um, in the next paragraph, LU1C, use flexible zoning techniques such as form-based code to promote mixed use development. I think we've done quite a bit of that and we've seen um, success in North Amherst Village Center with the Beacon Project, um, in um, the East Amherst with um, the new development that Amir McChee is building and also in the development that's just by the railroad tracks that um, Mr. Robaleski is building. So um, those um, have uh, are a result of, of using more flexible zoning, I think. Um, oops, the next page, page six, 3.6. You can stop me at any time if you have um, questions, just raise your hand and Christine can recognize you. I am undertake, watching for hands. Undertake rezoning efforts. This is LU1D. Undertake rezoning efforts that direct more intensive development to appropriate areas and limit development in key resource areas. So what I said was zoning amendments passed after 2010 allowed more density in downtown and village centers, including mixed use buildings by site plan review and eliminating the lot area requirement per dwelling unit for certain zoning districts, such as the BG, BVC and BN. I think that was really important because before 2010, it was really hard to build buildings in the downtown that had residential units because there was a requirement for um, lot area per dwelling unit. And that would have been really hard to accommodate in the downtown. Um, and restrictions in height were also amended to allow five-story buildings in the general business district. Now that's something that um, some people don't, uh, don't agree with. And that may be something that um, people want to look at and reconsider. So, uh, but it, it, this just points that out. Um, the next one is LU1E, revise existing zoning to encourage and include incentives for well-designed, energy efficient, infill redevelopment projects. So we have experienced more infill redevelopment projects. Um, and one of them is uh, the new project that's going in where the Amherst Motel was, um, was built and that uh, is actually a kind of a re, I wouldn't say it's a rezoning, but it's a um, reinterpretation of the zoning code to allow something like that to happen, to allow an existing non-conforming use to be um, transformed into a, a new non-conforming use that's actually bigger. Um, and in my mind, it is um, not more detrimental to the neighborhood. And that's something that the zoning board found when it reviewed that project, but I think that's a, a good use of, an, of a property that was 
relatively derelict in the past. So a new interpretation of the zoning bylaw allowed um, more dwelling units. I think there are probably twice as many dwelling units as were in the Amherst Motel, um, and they're going to be nicer and more um, modern. Um, let's see. Um, Whoop. LU1F. LU1F. Okay, where is LU1F here? Um, establish programs to encourage economic development in existing developed areas, IG economic opportunity area type programs. Well, we did have some economic opportunity areas um, back in the, I guess it was the 80s and the 90s, um, some were established. One of them was around Atkins Farms Market, and it allowed Atkins to um, expand. Um, those are not, as far as I know, very active in, in this day and age, but we do have something called an opportunity zone. And Nate and the former economic development director applied for a designation as an opportunity zone for North Amherst. Um, we've, we saw a lot of interest in this in the last uh, couple of years. We haven't seen much interest in it um, recently, but it allows developers to reduce their capital tax burden if they develop in these opportunity zones. So that's something that we, we um, applied for and we did receive the designation. We just haven't seen any uh, development resulting from that yet. Um, the next one is LU1G, reduce energy use by encouraging new residences near supporting goods and services in transit. So um, the zoning bylaw was, uh, was amended and special permits have been granted to allow more residential development in downtown and village centers, um, which are the areas that already have supporting goods and services. Um, and since 2010, the town has seen development or proposed development of housing in North Amherst Village Center, East Amherst Village Center, and the downtown. I think I estimated that there are about 228 units and also along the Hampton Road and University Drive. So we have gained um, a large number of dwelling units in the last 10 years in multifamily developments in places that were already developed. Um, here's one that um, Michael had an interesting comment about. This one is LU1H, create mechanisms for transfer of development rights, TDRs, from key resource areas and agricultural lands to village centers, downtown, and other specific districts and neighborhoods where denser development is more appropriate. So um, I made a note that we actually received a grant from um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and we worked with them uh, back in 2012 to try to figure out if this um, mechanism was appropriate for Amherst. And what we discovered was that um, there may be a lot of uh, areas in town that are interested in giving their um, development rights to someone else, but there weren't very many areas in town that were interested in receiving the development rights. So, um, for instance, in North Amherst, where um, someone might own large tracts of land that potentially could be developed for subdivision, residential subdivisions, um, potentially landowners could have um, sold their development rights to someone who owned property in a more dense location like the North Amherst Village Center. But it turned out that people who lived in the North Amherst Village Center weren't enthusiastic about receiving those development rights. So this was kind of, um, it was dropped. So Michael's comment was, well, why even leave it in here in the, in the um, master plan if we're not intending ever to do it? So I thought that was a really good observation. And my next iteration here will probably be to just take that out, out entirely. I was a little bit, um, reluctant to do that on my own, but since I've received comments from Michael that that would, you know, in his mind, he thinks that that should be eliminated and perhaps other other people would think that too. Um, let's see, where are we now? We're on page. Chris, can I interrupt one second? Sure. Because I know, I, I believe that you had said if people had questions to go ahead and raise their hand. Yeah, thank we, you. We do have two hands raised, so I don't know if we just want to take a minute and check in with Maria and Doug, or, I or if idea. I misunderstood. 
No, thanks for uh, noticing those hands go up. Um, I'll start with Maria and then Doug. All right, I'll try not to knock over my iPad this time. Um, <laughs> this is a great first step, Chris, and I'm glad that uh, I'm, I heard you go through a few things before I sort of, you know, commented on my notes. But generally, I think I see a direction where you're taking examples of where this master plan is outdated because now we're in a different time, like that example you showed early on where we're not doing sprawl anymore, we're doing more downtown development. So that's something worth changing versus another type of change, which is like Michael Bertwistle mentioned, if we have a new direction as far as how we wanna look forward, that's another way to change the master plan. So there's sort of the get rid of the outdated sort of notion of what we've been doing versus put in more things that look forward and that we want to do. And I agree that just putting facts of what has been done isn't really master plan material in my mind. It's sort of just, unless it's saying we've done this and here's how we're going to take a next step, I'm not sure it's worth putting it. So for example, yeah, that, that last one you mentioned, I found one, um, sorry about the TDR, I found one further out about, um, I forget where it was, but there are examples where, yeah, it's probably not worth just listing um, things that have been completed unless it leads to a next step. So um, I think you were asking for like input from us as a yes. board about like, and mm -hmm. so I, I feel like that's my sense is if it's just something that says we tried it and it didn't work, I'm not sure that's master plan worthy versus, um, let's see, what was an example you gave? Uh, the LU1C where you, you sort of explain the history of, you know, North Amherst and Atkins were unsuccessful with form-based zoning. That's true. Maybe it's a way to instead say, we are currently looking at form-based, uh, sorry, form-based zoning with uh, a 40R downtown um, as a way to learn from for future guidelines. So I think that's a better, not spin, but a better sort of way to word um, mm -hmm. all the sort of red stuff that you're you're adding. Um, but otherwise, I think you're in the right direction as far as just maybe it's an organizational thing for you that you're just writing down what you have done, what the you know department and the town hall has done. But I think the next layer is to think uh, what would be the master plan text for what has been completed. Because um, a lot of it was just sort of, um, this is what we've done. And maybe we could send a list of like, where we think you could just literally remove sections and then we can discuss that as a group because um, some things, yeah, are pretty important and I might think it's worth removing, but other people might think, well, I don't think that's appropriate. We need to write something about next steps for that rather than just remove it. So mm -hmm. um, I'll try to compile my notes where I think some sections just simply are outdated or could go away, but um, generally uh, I kind of, yeah, I did a really quick skim today and that's my general take um but i do think that the the current form-based zoning exercise happening downtown could be referenced a lot more because a lot of the issues have to do with um streetscape and um scales of things and i think that that exercise can teach us a lot to learn from and then i guess my last point is just um as you go through this what is the goal for tonight do you, do you want us to comb through paragraph by paragraph and give you feedback or is it just a way for you to explain your rationale? Cause I'm a little worried it might take <laughs> four hours to go through this. I'm just wondering like what kind of input do you want from us tonight? Um, it's well, not too is, late yet, but. May I respond? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so this is the first chance you all have had to look at these um, annotations that I've made and I wanted to get a sense from you about whether you thought I was going in the right direction or whether there was something else that you thought I should be adding. And so, um, you know, Michael's take was that we should be leaving out things that we don't care about anymore. And Michael and Maria are both saying that we should be talking more about what we're going to do proactively in the future, having to do with mm -hmm. any of these strategies and um, not so um, wedded to what we, have accomplished or um, you know what what the past has to say about this so that's unless you know, um, yeah, sorry that's good feedback for me 
I think it would be very helpful not to go through, um, you know, step by step, page by page tonight, but yeah. if everybody mm -hmm. could do the kind of um, review that Michael did, and I, I, I don't, I'm reluctant to send his to you because it'll color what you say. So uh, what I would like to do is like get all the comments and then send them all out, right? And we can have a robust discussion. And when we, um, when we send them all out, we'll put them online and the public can see them. So I think it'll have a more, um, it, there'll be a more rich discussion about this um, at a future date. And that might, maybe that would occur sometime in early July, I'm, I'm thinking right now, because we've got so many other things mm -hmm. coming up uh, in the right. near future. I had just one more question. Was one of the tasks of this master plan, like light revision, it was mm -hmm. to do the sort of updating you're doing, but also to fold in more green initiatives. Was that something that's part of the task or was that something that was like rumored that town council wanted to focus on? No, that was something that we were um, going to do and I didn't manage to uh, incorporate it into my okay. notations here. Um, Stephanie Ciccarello, who's the sustainability coordinator is um, reviewing the master plan and she's told me that she's going to give me um, her comments and her additions or you know whatever she would like to include and it would have to do with um, resilience and sustainability and climate change but I haven't heard uh, from her um, yet about that. Just to expand a little on that Chris from what I'm remembering um, just to remind everyone yes this is a master plan update light so we were trying to stay out of anything that's context and adding stuff that is like what we want and think now because as soon as we open that door well then we're all going to be in debate about is that included not included so we knew the safe way to go at this point was to at least update this document to make it more current it's because it's old right now and to make it better not a full new master plan um, and we want to keep it um, clean, like with rules, how we're updating it. I, I am on the fence with removing things that are historical because as one thing I have learned in my many years of being on committees is things are forgotten because people change, staff changes, people change, committees change. And it's hard for us to remember as a planning board what happened four years ago, never mind 10 years ago. And if anything, referring to some of the new plans and initiatives, guidelines per, that have happened in the last 10 years, I would like to see them actually hyperlinked in the document because a lot of people are only going to be looking at this online and not looking at a paper document. And that way, it almost becomes a repository of information where you can go to find more. So back to the environmental thing. It was my understanding, Chris, that the environmental committee, um, I forget their acronym, that they're actively working on a report right now and our hope they had planned before COVID to be done by May or June. Um, so maybe that's taking a little bit longer like all of our initiatives, but that when that came out, again, it wasn't work that we were going to determine about. We're just going to reference that document, create a link. And if people want to see some of our green initiatives, they would go to that. So, you know, it's, it's a document, it's a resource, but anyways, we're all going to think about that. And I also agree now I'm thinking, Chris, we shouldn't send out Michael's until, I mean, everybody, and I'm, you know, this is our thing, everybody, planning board. We, the, you know, bylaws and all that, public way, it all goes to town council, but this is our thing. So we need to do our homework and we really got to try to stick to these deadlines because it will just drag on months and months and we're going to fall way behind. So that was a knot. Um, I rec I'm going to call on Doug and then there's Janet and I, um, well... Yeah. Chris, your hand is up right now. Do you have something that you want to say right now? Or uh, I wanted to say that um, in terms of the environmental and sustainability things, I think yeah. I am expected. I am expecting Stephanie to write some text with regard to that. Of course, she will refer to the um, to the plan that she's working on with um, ECAC. I guess they call themselves ECAC. That's the group. Yep. I see. Yes. So she's going to be. Um, working with them and we can refer to their plan but she will also be providing me with um, yes the text to put into many of these 
um, the, these sections here, but I just haven't yes. received it yet. I recognize that, but I also knew that there was a report that she's worked, like that they're going to yes. come up with. So that we knew in the time we would be able to refer to that because we won't be done till after they're done. So yeah, yeah that's probably you. actually not going to be done till next, um, till December. I think they were initially supposed to have it done by June, but then they got yes. an extension to their, um, their grant. And December's okay because we won't be done by December either. So that's all right. But we knew that they will probably be done before we're done. So right. we'll keep that in mind. Um, thanks, Chris. So I'm, I acknowledge Doug and then there's Janet and then I see Jack. Okay. Um, so I read through it and uh, my first thought was, gee, this is really uncontroversial. Um, you know, you've uh, basically recapped what has happened. Um, I guess if I step back from it, I could say this looks like a report back to town council, you know, kind of an interim where the state of the town in terms of, of the master plan we approved 10 years ago or whatever. So, you know, it doesn't, it seemed like it would, if this approach would be pretty easy to accomplish, you know, it's, it's fair, um, a fair amount of work to pull together the facts, but uh, it would be easy to accomplish and easy for town council to endorse. You know, um, I agree actually with Michael and with Maria that it might be more useful to have, you know, maybe without changing the, the, the 2010 text, you know, the, the 2020 text could be Here's what we've done, and based on our experience, we're going to want to put more emphasis in this direction rather than that direction, mm. just as this is the way the world looks to us now, rather than we're going to take things out. I think that's a mistake, um, you know, because it does, it goes a little farther and starts to open the door toward, you know, gee, we should reconsider the whole thing. And uh, Chris, if you're trying to keep to a deadline, um, you know, like we did uh, for the comments on the minutes, it would be, if, if you want our comments on what you've written, it'd be nice to have a date by which we need to provide them. Thank you. Okay, good. May I um, follow that up with an email? Give you a date in an email? Maybe we should do that because we did set a date um, a couple meetings back. Uh, that we were supposed to give her comments by last week. Um, but maybe, Chris, that's, we probably need to see it twice because sometimes people miss something in these meetings. So, um, yes. A reminder from you would be good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I, um, thanks, Doug. I rec are you done, Doug? Is that okay. Um, and Janet, and then I see Jack. Um, I appreciate everybody's comments. Um, I, I sort of, st I've been struggling. Um, I, I found it really useful to see Christine Brestrup's commentary in text um, because you, you read the text and you read what she says and you reflect on it. And um, I, I do agree with the comment that it probably doesn't belong in the master plan, you know, at the end of the day, but it is kind of a useful history and it gets you thinking and looking at, I also think we need to look ahead. I, I was putting the hat on of thinking, um, a little bit to the future when we have the master plan on the web page and we've gone to the public saying, here's the land use section, here's what the master plan says, and here's what's been done, here's what's not been done. And so I kind of like my thoughts went to the implementation matrix that I think is part of chapter 10. And I thought maybe Christine's commentary or history or, or updates on what was done should be a column in that matrix, that list of steps and strategies. And then you could say, you know, something like completed, partially completed, not done, with no shame. Um, and then maybe a column of next steps were hopeful dates for completion. And then the missing piece in, on that matrix now is who's responsible for getting it done. Because if nobody's assigned the job or thinks they're assigned the job, no one's really going to do it. So I wondered if looking at the implementation matrix and using that as a document that could guide the public and ourselves as we kind of sort through things would be useful. Um, so that's one big question. 
like how are we gonna you know how are we gonna talk about it in a constructive way um and maybe the implementation matrix would be a good structure for that the other problem a question i had was i think in previous um, planning boards have incorporated the Amherst housing market study and housing production plan as part of the master plan. And, you know, so those are really long documents and they do have strategies that would directly affect land use. And I wondered how do we put that into the plan if we just reference them and then there's like 100 pages of this and 60 pages of that, is it a way that, and is it, is it become unworkable or will anyone be able to understand it all? Um, unless they're like people who like to read something complicated like the tax code and things like that. So I was struggling with, um, I was even personally struggling with like, if I'm gonna send comments to Chris, like how do I put them into, you know, kind of thing. So I just had a lot of questions about structure and what's the best way to present to the public or for us to talk amongst ourselves. And so I'm glad we're having this discussion. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, Chris, I do think, I know we're not working on that tonight, but I think Janet's points on the implementation matrix that really is a key part that could quickly show what's done what's half done and a couple more columns might be needed and i just wanted to remind everybody that when this got passed it's the 2010 and there was supposed to be this master plan implementation committee that was kind of doing this every year and and reporting back and creating a report that said what had been done at, or investigated to be pursued or not pursued and those reports would have been referenced in this update except we don't have any of them so in a way chris is doing double duty she's updating the master plan but she's also filling in this gap that didn't happen which hopefully now will happen after we update this. And the next 10 years, there will be a master plan implementation committee with their reports, and that will help drive the committee that does the big redo in 2030. So I just wanted to put that historical context out there. Um, I see Jack, and then next is Michael. How much time do you see people? So, uh, yeah, I, I really like the detail of the comments and, and kind of struggle with how the update should be without rewriting it. And I, you know, I, I love, I love using footnotes and these would kind of be like section notes, how Chris has them in and uh, a lot of them will probably be, uh, or just, you know, thought provoking and they may be deleted, but some of them, I like the historical, um, explanation, you know, in the last 10 years. Uh, so I'd like to keep, some, you know, the, the, like the historical sort of thing, just for the sake of expediting, you know, completion of the update. You know, I think the use of, of these notes is, is, is good. Um, and, you know, lot, lots of you have, have been, you know, saying the same, but I guess some sections will ha will need to have like you know more strike out more heavily editing versus just uh, a note, um, and I'd be very interested to see you know Mike's comments at this time to help me uh, uh, in terms of reviewing this because th this is a lot of work. You could you could spend you know weeks on each section <laughs> as a planning board member, which I don't have, um, so. I would recommend that we send Mike's comments for the benefit of the whole board. Um, and then some of the things I, I just saw, like like brownfields that aren't applicable. I mean, it, it gives the master plan a little bit of a boilerplate feel if that's really the case. But, you know, we should just get rid of this, some of that stuff. So some of this, you know, so that's a different kind of edit or update, but um, Basically, those are my comments. Thanks, Jack. So uh, um, may I ask yes. a question here? Um, and this is going to be for Pam. If And ideally, and, and Christine Gray Mullen and I will talk about this later when we get towards the end of this discussion. Ideally, we're going to have a master plan web page where people can, um, the members of the public can see what the latest thing is and then comment on it. But in the interim, would it be possible to have a section on the planning board webpage about the master plan and maybe um, 
post this thing that I've written as a very rough draft, post Michael's comments next to it, so that um, other members of the planning board could see it and the public could see it and we're not breaking any open meeting law. I guess that's what I was worried about. Um, I was worried about breaking the open meeting law by sending out Michael's comments. They weren't part of the packet and they were, you know, his thoughts about something which we're not supposed to send in, in between meetings, except if we post them, then it's okay to send them. So anyway, I wondered if Pam could advise me on whether it would be possible to make a little corner of the planning board webpage. Well, can I just interrupt, Chris? Why don't you just put it on the master plan page? Is that developed? Well, we could. It's kind of obscure, though, isn't it? I maybe not. We can think okay, about it. But you can make a link then to the planning board page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the we can talk about this more later. I mean, if we're ready to go on this, then Brianna and I. I mean, I've been just waiting till she had air, but mm -hmm. it can probably be done next week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the way I see it with the website, it's pretty much the, the sky's the limit because mm -hmm. you just can create pages and link them. Um, I have to be honest with you, I haven't been paying any kind of attention as to what's been going on with the master plan web page because it wasn't on my plate and my, my plate has other things that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. However, we can absolutely get something up there ASAP if need be. So maybe we could just start putting this stuff up there and it's going to be chaotic and when we hear from the public like what does this mean what are what are you doing what are you <laughs> talking about we're going to have to be ready to defend ourselves and say we're putting it out there we want everybody to see it and it's a work in progress and eventually it'll get done you know it's not it's not in any way finished it's rough right and we'll have to be willing to um, take the slings and arrows about that, right? Well, well you can you... just put a disclaimer on there. <laughs> you know, just, just saying that it's, you know, it isn't finished and you expect to be having public meetings and... Um... Mm -hmm. And that way when I get some other comments from somebody, I can put them up there and then everybody can see them and then the next time we meet we can talk about all of these things mm -hmm. um sort of yeah chris we'll talk after because that's not the process we've laid out for the website that can go up in a week so mm -hmm. you know i don't want to start another system and then have to change okay. um and and it's about collecting people's comments if we start doing it this way it's the same way we've been sort of half hodging it for 10 years mm -hmm. um i think we want to be orderly and collect the comments and um, and everybody be seeing the same thing that everybody else is seeing. So the process of tonight was not to start the whole public process. That's why we're not taking public comment. The main thing we were to do was to get Chris comments on what we thought of what is going on now with her first light draft. So I think Chris is listening to all of us and looking at all and actually I mean, looking at each other's comments probably isn't super important right now. It's about what each of us is thinking and she's listening to all of us, but it, you know, she's the one working on it. So I'm sure you've got a lot of thoughts in your head right now, Chris, about, oh, you know, maybe I'm going to alter this and add this and do this. So I'm already getting eager to see like, when can we get another first, a second draft of this? where you're like okay i heard you all this is now what how i'm thinking to do this master plan update light yep so i think we can talk about that when we get to um the point of talking about our schedule for the next yeah. couple of months and maybe that's going to be later in the meeting because um, i'm very interested to know when do you, you think you could get another draft done with this. I mean, we had set a very aggressive schedule six months ago on how to do this. Um, mm -hmm. And I know times are strange, but, you know, we need you to communicate with us on what is achievable and what's not realistic. So here's what I can say about the next month, um, June. 
here we are at the end of May. So June uh, 3rd, we have a, a meeting where we have two public hearings, um, one about all about learning, which is a preschool, and the other one is about the common school. They're relatively lightweight, but still we have to have the process. Then um, we were going to receive comments on chapter 40R from planning board members on that day, or hopefully before that day. I think we had set yep. May 27th as we the did. day when we were gonna receive 27th comments. And present them uh, at the meeting on June 3rd and have some kind of, probably not terribly in-depth discussion, but somewhat of a discussion. Then we're also going to have um, Mandy Jo Haneke and possibly some of her um, members or co-members of CRC come to us that night and talk to us about the zoning, um, how, how we're going to um, update the zoning bylaw, revise the zoning bylaw, whatever you want to call it. So that's a packed night. Mm -hmm. It is. Then we have... Um, uh, then, uh, so eventually we're going to get. I think the seventeenth looks okay. The seventeenth looks okay. Yeah. We have a joint hearing we have to do first off the bat, probably with CRC. Yeah. But then, as far as I know, we don't have anything else that night. I think that is that is the case as of right now. Um, so we could do the seventeenth. Is and that's enough time for you to redo this. And bring well, it back to us. I don't know. I mean, because we've got a lot of other things going on, but I could try. Well, I mean, you don't have to answer right now, but think about, and so the next option is July 1st. So I think you just have to look at your workload and contemplate what you're hearing tonight. And, you know, yeah, realistically, when can you come back with another draft? Okay. So I'll have to think about that. July 1st, we're planning to have the um, Amherst Media Project. Yeah, right. I think I had talked at some point about having it on June 17th, but right now I don't think that's reasonable. So um, so July 1st would be Emerson Media and we can be sure that that's going to be, um, uh, what shall I say, a popular night for the planning board. <laughs> planning board's gonna be very popular that night. Um, meaning we'll have a lot of public interest. Okay, all right. Um... So I'll think about that. So maybe, maybe by the 17th, uh, but given what we're going to talk about later, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still a little, a little uh, tentative about that. So a whole month away. So maybe. Okay. That would well, mean if you can just, you know, think about it. And then as we're making the agendas, as the weeks yeah. go on, you know, mm -hmm. let us know. Um, we're not trying to be unreasonable here, but we are saying, you know, we, we have an aggressive schedule. Um, so what would that mean as far as getting comments from planning board members? Um, that would mean me getting comments in the next two weeks by, by June 3rd. Oh or no, you should only get comments in the next week, Chris. You, you gave us a deadline of last week. So we're already past the deadline you would ask. So let's give it another week. And by next Wednesday, people will give you their comments on the on this current chapter because then you need you're not going to really start moving on the next draft until you've heard from us and that's right. and yeah. thought about that. Mm -hmm. So if that's already next week, um, you know, if you're looking at the 17th or July 1st, you need time to actually then come up with a new draft. So next week is the 27th. So we already said that we were getting comments on um, 40R? On yes. The so and so okay, both. Get comments on the master plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. And 40R. So we have our homework. Yes, I know everybody. They're going to be busy this weekend. <laughs> Good reads. Um, and, and I mean, with the master plan, I mean, neither one of them are like detail comments. You're, you're looking for you know, thoughts and my overall approach. I'm not looking for you to um, edit edit each sentence here, and right. um, just tell me what do you think about this approach? Should we go more towards what we need to do in the future? Do you still want me to include some of these historical facts? Um, general approach comments. Yeah. Okay. So Michael's been very patient. I see his hand up there and he's going to say whatever he wants to say, but I also am throwing it out there um, to people like 
do you want Chris to go through the rest of this document or should, can we just move on from here? So I recognize Michael and at this time, that's the only hand I see. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, the reason I ask is because I was, I crashed and I was offline for about 15 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I left about, or I was, I was dismissed about the time uh, Chris was talking about the beginning of the land use chapter and uh, referenced what I had, uh, uh, what I had sent her a couple of times. And I'm not quite sure whether maybe this is all uh, irrelevant because she's already said that, said that or not, but bear with me. Um, the, the, re the way I went through the, do the document um, was, as you're suggesting, to make it seem uh, more forward-looking and less historical uh, than I thought that it was. And uh, the, I had basically three kind of strategies when I did that. One was to uh, change some specific wording. Things like uh, LU2A says change zoning. And, and then uh, I, I changed, I suggest that that be continue to pursue zoning changes, which allow, suggesting that we have already made some progress in that area, but not completely. And that the uh, lines and uh, the additions in red, which Christine had put in, uh, I it edited that a little bit to suggest how that might be. Uh, might uh, might work. So I had a fair amount of those continue to do something or uh, pursue or rather than uh, start over, continue the revision of. Un un instead of undertake zoning efforts, continue zoning efforts, that, that kind of thing. Uh, that was one, one approach I took to making the specific edits within the, within the document. The two things that um, I really felt were um, central to what I had in mind and the reasons why I would really like everybody on the planning board to get this document and respond to it as part of what their own um, responses to the document might be is because it, it really does take a slightly different, maybe even a significantly different approach. Um, I think that, that uh, the document really needs to think about what we should, it's, it needs to read as if it were written today. And it's, it's what we, are, want to do over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, that's what the, the town council seems to want, a document which represents the current thinking of the town. And as far as the planning board is concerned, we are sort of that part of the whole process. So I think we really, rather than try to say, well, we've done this so far, and we now need to do more of this. We just need to say, we need to, we need to do this. We need to continue to do this, or we need to start doing this, one of the two. Depends on what the, what the issue is. Uh, the other part of this process, and uh, this is where all the, all the historical annotations really come in, is the, this implementation matrix, which is buried as an appendix, and I believe really needs to be chapter 11. Uh, and that the, the implementation matrix, I don't know whether you've all seen it or not, maybe you haven't, maybe you haven't, but it really, it, it boils down each uh, particular objective, uh, states it, and then has a column for who should do that, and then another column for when it should be done by. And I think that in implementation matrix is the place for all of this historical documentation. I think that's where we should put uh, responsible, the, the, identify who ought to be doing these things, and then indicate in the, in the other column how much of it's already been done and when the rest of it should be done and how we might imagine this happening in the, over the next 10 years. Um, so that's what I, that's the way I approached editing the document. And um, I, I, would, I would hope that this doesn't violate meeting laws because if we have to, everybody has to look at this document at the moment we're talking about it in a meeting, uh, then I don't think everything, we're never going to get anywhere. Either that or the document's going to be ignored, and I hope it isn't ignored. I didn't spend an enormous amount of time on it. I spent maybe six or eight hours on it. But, uh, you know, it's, it, it is complicated, and it needs thought, and it needs a way of thinking about it that, um, that focuses your ideas on a, on a on a plan, uh, so that's that's what I think. Uh, and I, uh, sorry to be taking up so much time. No, that was really helpful, Michael. Thank you. Um, I see uh, Chris. So um, I was wondering, and this is a question for Pam again. 
Can we somehow incorporate Michael's comments into our packet from last week? Like, could we have packet appendix one and just put it on the web page with the packet that you put there last Friday? It came in, you know, too late to incorporate into our packet, but if it had come in Friday morning instead of Friday evening, we might have put it into the packet and then put it up on the web page, which means that it wouldn't have violated open meeting yet. So mm -hmm. that's a question for Pam. Could we do something like that? I believe so. Um, and I'm actually going to be in the office tomorrow. So I think um, it would be its own separate little package. And I would need to title it something like additional documents. Yeah. You see by so planning board, da, da, da. I'm yep. very excited to hear that because this has been an issue that I felt has always been there. The packet goes out, which by the way, I didn't get till four o'clock today. Oh, um, the packet goes out, but then there's lots of things you send us through emails mm -hmm. after that moment, all the way up until the meeting. And those never get included in anything that gets posted online and they don't get included with the minutes. So. I've always felt there was a drop of transparency there. So if we have the ability to do a follow-up packet and then just post it, that would be fantastic. It covers a lot of this. So not only this, the comments from Michael, but any of the other documents that had to do with the public hearings or whatever, just PDF it just like you do and put it up there. Can mm -hmm. that happen? We're getting off topic here, but I got so Sounds excited. Like I was could. like, oh my God, can we do this? We can do almost we anything. <laughs> we, did right, well, get we can talk minutes. offline. If you guys just say, yeah, we can do that, then great. We yeah. can make this happen. Fantastic. Oh, Thank we're you. moving into the digital world. Um, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to recognize Doug. Yeah, Chris, you had asked whether we thought we, that we needed Chris to go all the way through all three yes. pages of this. Uh, with all of her annotations. And my answer would be, no, I really don't need that, nor do I really want that. I, I Thank you. And I think a bunch of us feel that way. Um, I'm going to recognize David in a second. But Chris, just if you could talk about, there was one thing I wasn't sure about this. You, you put your thoughts, and I knew this was just a first draft, but I'm sort of looking at what's up on the screen. I can only see half of it. But like LU1H, we have the old writing and then I'm thinking about what Michael was saying, like how you want to like maybe update that. So it's like continue to, or we have, but then you had your stuff in red and I wasn't sure if you're just redlining and then later you would just accept it and it would become like a second paragraph in black below the existing paragraph or. You know, I really hadn't thought much about formatting. I was just like putting thoughts down on the paper. So, um, I, I, but the other thing was I was reluctant to mess too much with the existing text. I thought that whatever we were adding should be added in a way that people would know what was added. So, um, can I was we redline? Like, can you do the the track changes? Track changes, but that disappears, right? Um, Only if you turn so, it off. But what I'm saying is that um, once we publish this. How will people know what's the old master plan and what's the new? Maybe we don't care. You about can that keep plan. saving it as individual. We'll talk about that too. You that could because then we'll actually see what's going to be the end product. Like right now, it's like your add-on thoughts to the mm -hmm. end. But yes. we can talk more about that in process. Mm -hmm. I know we just talked about that a little bit months and months ago, which mm -hmm. seems like forever ago. Yep. But all right, thanks, Chris. Um, all right, so I see David and then Michael. Hi, I, I agree with Doug. I, I think that we can, uh, I would enjoy moving on. I think we're getting very much in the weeds as I understand it. W uh, the planning board has a hard deadline of next Wednesday to return comments to Chris Brestrup on both the mass, this chapter of the master plan update and the 40R comments. I think that, you know, big picture and not weeds. This is not a master plan review that's going to happen in 2030. Um, and so I would, again, um, urge us to, I, I, I think that this is a great um, presentation and I look forward to digging deeper. Thank you, Chris. Um, but, but 
I'd like to move on because we have, I think, more pressing new business to do so. And then before I, I, I give up the, my, if, when we do move on, I would like to request a five minute um, break. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, and all hands went away. So why don't we just take a five minute break here? I have 8.52, so it will resume at 8.57 and we're gonna move on to, at that point, item five, old business. We good? So you can put your video down and your mic off if you want, and I'll see, we'll all be here in five minutes. I'll stay live so that the um, public knows that, and maybe Pam, if you don't mind staying up, so they know that we're, we're here. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll stay up. I was just uh, gonna turn myself off. <laughs> no. I will be they back. They can all turn off, the, just in case someone came in on the Zoom. I don't even know who we have there right now. You'll see my quilt. Yeah, your quilt is beautiful. It was made by a woman from Amherst. Oh, nice. Is Chris Vestrup making taking a break at the moment, or is she on? I believe she is. Chris, are you there? Yeah, she probably ran away. <laughs> and Pam is gone. Yeah, everyone but you and I. Okay. <laughs> and just to tell the public, if anyone's watching on Amherst Media, we're just uh, taking a five-minute break, um, and we'll resume at 8.57. I'm back. Welcome back. Thank you. So it's 8.55 and if anyone is watching or just tuning in, we're in a five minute break and we'll resume at 8.57. Oh, Pam? Yes. You, uh, I had a question, Michael Burt so I had a question about uh, the packet that we received, that we was sent out, which I, I also just got this afternoon about four o'clock. <laughs> It, it, there's a there's a set a series of, of four or five pages uh, stapled together called Master Plan Update, and it shows a series of maps, um, and MGIS land use information. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not quite sure how what that is re in reference to, what that relates to in terms of of our of the master plan discussion. Can you? Sure. You know what, I, Let, Pam, let's wait till the meeting resumes so others are okay. here because it's part of the meeting. And Chris can, it, sh that was going to be part of her talk, Michael, but I'm we, sorry. we I, cut her that's, off. That's probably yeah. when I'm offline. I'm sorry. But we can, we'll ask Pam, we'll ask Chris to just address that maybe during her um, report of staff. We'll just ask mm -hmm. her what that was. Okay. So thank you, Michael, for pointing that out. Michael, I kept seeing you go into the attendees and I kept putting you back into the <laughs> panelists. I don't know, I don't know what was happening, but from I what I could see. I was operating on battery uh, and then it, it failed and I had to plug in and then I had to reconnect. And for some reason I reconnected in a different way. And I don't know why it wasn't it took me forever to try to figure that out. But I think everything is the way it's supposed to be now. You conquered it, Michael. You did I good. Good job, Michael. It's not easy. 
and I had to, and I had to put up a different background too. I had to turn the whole thing around. Now you see the other half of my room. <laughs> I ha I have a question that I meant to ask in the beginning, which is when it, when you said Christine like contact Pam or Sean, I thought I don't have their like would I contact them by text or how would I contact them? I just um, we talked about that in the very beginning. Pam, did they ever get phone numbers? I think some. I mean, I did. Uh. I I believe everybody has been sent sent phone numbers, but I can do that again. Can you do that again with your uh -huh. cell and Sean's yeah. and, um, and worst I cases, I think put mine on there too. I think most people have my phone number. You know, I do watch the phone too, because Janet, you've done that. You've yeah. texted yes. me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You start reaching out to anybody. Oh my God. So yeah, Pam, if you could do that, that would be great. So it's actually 857. Um, I don't know if everybody's back. If you can just click your raise hand members, if you're here, so I'll know that you're actually here. And I see Michael, I see Janet, I see Doug, I see Maria. Does anyone, I'm pretty old. Do you remember that, that in the magic mirror, this, it was like early kid TV when we were, I was like four and it was something about, she looked in this magic mirror, it was on PBS. I see Jimmy. Oh, I see Yes. Romper room. Romper. Yeah, was that what it was? I don't even remember what it was called. I see. And that's what I feel like. I'm like on TV going, I see. All right. So we can start back again. Um, so master plan off Chris, we do have a question for you later that we'll ask you in your uh, report of staff and we'll come back to that. And um, so now we're going to go to item uh five old business and there's nothing there chris do we have nothing no business okay we like that we'll go to item six new business we do have something or i thought we did we do yeah um yeah we do it's not on here but you're going to talk about something okay it, well there was a revised, revised um, agenda, agenda yeah, that I, i've out. got the one from the packet that's the problem yeah. yeah let me go back to the other one so may I speak? Yes, yes, you have the floor. Go ahead, Chris. So the revised agenda includes um, a new idea that came about in the last two weeks. And um, it was really Rob Mora who came up with this. And it was an effort to, um, we realized that the businesses in town were having such a hard time with um, COVID-19 and having to close down and, um, you know, we were really trying hard to think of something that could help them. So uh, Rob came up with this um, kind of three pronged uh, way of helping the businesses. And, um, and Paul Bockelman thought it was a good idea and he presented it to town council on Monday night and it was presented to the CRC on Tuesday. And now we're presenting it to uh, members of the planning board. You did receive the, um, the memo from Paul in your email, so you have a little bit of advance warning, um, or I shouldn't say warning, <laughs> advance notice, because <laughs> we think it's a good idea. Um, so the idea is that we would, um, we would try to figure out how to, um, how to amend the zoning bylaw to allow um, certain uses to have a little bit easier time to um, start up or restart. And um, right now, as you know, um, well, there are a lot of restaurants that are operating or have operated in downtown Amherst. Um, many of them are closed now. Some of them probably won't come back uh, online. Um, there will be empty uh, storefronts and um, some of the businesses will come back, and we're hoping that that is the case for more than more than you know most. Um, but in any event, um, what we're trying to do is think of a way that we can adapt our zoning to make it easier for them. Um, right now, with the current zoning, uh, it takes a long time to get a business established, especially if the business is a restaurant that um, serve, serves alcohol and um, has to go to the design, or the, not the design review board, but the zoning board of appeals if they're open late or um, whatever their situation is. So 
Um, even if they're going to the planning board, uh, it can take, um, you know, two and a half months and the Zoning Board of Appeals sometimes takes three months um, to get a permit. And if someone started now, they wouldn't actually have their permit until probably sometime in September. So we're trying to think of ways that we could get, kind of jumpstart this process. And Rob came up with the idea that um, perhaps for the next six months, well, I actually didn't go, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, what's the best way to describe this, but okay, so the first aspect of this I is- I think zoning. it says 180 days, Chris. Yeah, the first aspect is zoning, second aspect is use of the public ways, and the third aspect is um, amending the liquor license laws. So um, the first thing is zoning, and what we would try to do is for 180 days or six months, um, probably starting sometime in July, we would um, adopt temporary zoning. And the temporary zoning would be related to specific uses. And I think if you go to page, um, it's not this page, but the next page of the handout, um, Pam, or maybe not even that page, this page where it starts draft. This is the draft zoning bylaw that we're bringing to you. Um, so the purpose of it is to encourage and facilitate the reopening of existing businesses and the opening of new businesses and to stimulate economic activity in the aftermath of COVID-19. Um, so it would affect uses, new and existing uses in the general business district, the limited business district, um, business village center, business neighborhood, and the commercial zoning district. And it would also... Um, deal with pre-existing non-conforming uses. Um, the uses that we're talking about aren't mixed-use buildings and apartment buildings and hotels or anything like that. We're, we're very limited in the uses that we're talking about. It's really retail establishments, um, you know, clothing stores, bookstores, um, that kind of thing, uh, personal care establishments, um, you know, hair salons, um, I suppose tattoo parlors would be included, but in any event, um, personal care establishments and food and drink establishments. And that's the main uh, section here that we wanted to um, help, help out, the restaurants, the class one and class two restaurants. So those are the uses that we're zeroing in on. And then any accessory uses that are associated with them. Um, and accessory uses could be outdoor dining, live entertainment, and what we're calling drive-through facilities, but we're really not expecting someone to set up a drive-through window like they'd have at McDonald's or something like that. We're really trying to capture the curbside um, uh, delivery where um, you know someone comes out and, and hands you your, um, your tray or your bag of things that you've already ordered. In Rob's mind, the building commissioner's mind, those are really drive-through facilities, um, and we have them now, but they haven't been permitted in some way. So um, this would also include um, waivers and modifications from things like um, parking requirements and um, sign bylaw. They could include waivers and modifications. Um, design review would be uh, suspended for certain things. It would be suspended for signage lighting, um, placement of outdoor furnishings, and other non-permanent building or site alterations. So we're not talking about, um, you know, putting a new addition on your building. We're just talking about um, making it possible for people to have um, outdoor dining of some sort. Um, the application process would really be similar to uh, what we expect for site plan review and special permits. There would be a, an application form People would have to submit plans. Um, they would have to give us management plan information. And um, the building commissioner, in consultation with me as the planning director, would review the applications and be able to issue administrative approvals instead of requiring site plan review and special permits. And we would um, review these applications using the criteria in 10.38 and 11.24. And I think we're both pretty familiar with how um, the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals use those criteria um, for these types of uses. Um, we would also solicit comments from 
uh, other public officials and staff, including the fire chief, the police chief, the public health director, the superintendent of public works, or the town manager. And we, the building commissioner would issue a decision to either approve, approve with conditions, or deny the request within 10 business days. And that's really a vast uh, change over the current situation. Right now, when we get an application in, it takes three weeks to a month to, um, to have a public hearing. It could even take longer than that. Um, then once we have the public hearing, um, we have to write the decision and then get the decision signed and filed with the town clerk. And if it's a special permit, it has to go through a 20 day appeal period. So this is an attempt to, for a limited period, for the period of um, 180 days, be able to allow things to occur that um, would normally take much longer. And then if someone objected to a decision that was made by the building commissioner, um, that person or entity could appeal the decision to the Zoning Board of Appeals just the way they currently can do. Um, they can appeal any decision to the, to the Zoning Board. Um, so we think this is a good idea and what it requires is it requires a zoning amendment. Um, and it would be, uh, we have a space in our zoning bylaw in Article 14, which had been used for phased growth but we did away with phased growth a number of years ago. So now that section is reserved. So we could um, just put this new uh, zoning section into um, that portion of the zoning bylaw. We have had uh, the town council look at this draft that we've come up with, and he made um, several suggestions about how to improve it. Um, we're gonna send it back to him this week for his, um, his secondary review. And um, the proposal is to uh, hold a joint public hearing about this proposed zoning amendment on June 10th. And the joint public hearing would be with the CRC. Um, as I said previously, the CRC has already seen this and um, they appear to be uh, in favor of it. Um, so why don't I stop there and you can ask questions and make comments and then uh, we can have a conversation. Um, I don't see any hands up yet, but Chris, can we carry it a little bit further on, you know, I sent out that yes. email to everybody asking yes. about yeah. June 10th, so. So I, I am going to carry it a little further in the sense that um, I forgot to talk about use of the public way. And I also forgot to talk about the liquor licensing. So um, in many uh, cases here, um, people who have these establishments would be able to use portions of their own private property to either have outdoor dining or potentially outdoor displays of books or clothing that they wanted to offer. And part of this is in response to the fact that we know that restaurants and retail stores that come back into business aren't going to be able to have a full complement of customers in their establishments. They're going to be limited to, you know, 25% initially and maybe 50% later on, but they're not going to be able to have 100% of their normal customer load for quite a while. So the idea is that they could use um, portions of their own private property in the vicinity of their business, or they could spill out into the public way. And that might mean, you know, taking a parallel parking space along the edge of the road and turning it into um, something similar to a parklet. I think you've probably read about parklets. And in fact, we had a couple in downtown Amherst in the last few years. So the idea is just to sort of cordon off a parking space and let people sit there and be served by um, the workers in the restaurant. Uh, people might also be able to use parts of the sidewalk where the sidewalk is wide enough. And there might be little alleyways here and there that could be used. Um, or parking lots behind buildings. So you know, there's a wide variety of places where this could occur. And it could occur, as I said, either on private property or on public property. If it occurred on public property, um, the second part of this request, uh, not part of the zoning, but part of the request to um, town council is to authorize the town manager to allow these businesses to use the public way um, to uh, to accomplish some of these uses. 
And then the third part of it is to try to work with the Board of License Commissioners and the um, state to um, expedite um, the expansion of premises. So when someone gets a liquor license, they have a particular limited place where they can serve alcohol. But if you're talking about allowing um, people to serve on the sidewalk or in a little parklet that's created in the parking space, that would require expansion of premises. So um, the state is, is talking about this, about allowing um, an expedited process with the ABCC, and the town has also started to talk about it with the Board of License Commissioners. So those are the three aspects, the zoning, the use of the public way, and the, um, the liquor license. So I think uh, Christine was starting to talk about um, schedule. So why doesn't she uh, pick up there? And, and talk about schedule about when we're going to be doing this. I don't know a whole lot, but what I do know is this will be a bylaw change that has to go all the way to town council and they have to um, approve it. So ironically, uh, maybe there'll be more questions at our next meeting when Mandy Jo Henneke and CRC is coming with that flow chart um, to discuss because this is going to be our first living example of sort of living through that. And what it requires is a joint hearing um, with planning board and CRC to um, both approve the proposed amendment, which we will have, um, and from there then it goes to town council where they would give it final approval. So um, it will be during a planning board meeting um, and they come and join us. And that's why I had asked for your availability on June 10th at 6.30. Um, and why it got pushed, you know, some people are like, why aren't we doing this right now? Um, as Chris can further explain, she's got to file notices and the final wording and everything. It's sort of like a rush to town meeting, getting this um, article ready and set and have it go through the proper processes um, and notifications so that we can have that joint hearing. That's what I know. Chris, do you have anything to add about that? This would be the only thing on the, um, mm -hmm. on the docket for June 10th, because you already have um, meetings scheduled for June 3rd and June 17th. So this would be a specific night that was just set up to consider this zoning amendment with the uh, CRC. Um, a, both bodies are required to hold public hearings to change zoning. So, um, and uh, the town council has um, determined that they would really like to have these public hearings held jointly to the extent that that's possible. And it seems like in this case, it will be possible on June 10th. So, and the um, notifications will be done by then so we can have it. Yeah, the notifications will be sent out on this Friday uh, with the expectation that there will be an ad in the paper next Wednesday and the following Wednesday. So on the May 27th and June 3rd, there will be um, notifications in the paper. We also have to send notifications to all of the abutting towns and to the... Um, hmm. Uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and one other entity, I think it's DHCD, that's right. Um, so those are two state, quasi-state organizations that we have to send notifications to. Um, so that's that's it in a nutshell. Um, do you have any questions? I see three hands. I'm going to recognize Doug, then Michael, then David. Okay, Doug? Yeah, I... I uh... I confess I didn't scrutinize the draft closely, but I wanted to just ask, uh, is this envisioned as a permanent change or if it's a temporary, well, you have a temporary process for approval after one, during 180 days. Does that mean the approvals sunset after 180 days or how do you put the genie back in the bottle once you've approved all this and everybody has a business plan based on using sidewalks and public ways. Thank you. May I respond a question? To that? Chris, if I can just tag on and add to his, and what would happen if it was needed to be extended? Um, 
so it is envisioned to be temporary um, to the extent that um, that makes sense. And probably many of the outdoor operations would cease to exist or would be uh, given a condition that they needed to expire, um, you know, Thanksgiving or the beginning of December or something like that. Um, I had a conversation with the building commissioner about this though. And, you know, for somebody who's starting a restaurant, you know, say it's a new business and they're taking over an existing uh, restaurant that doesn't, um, you know, that isn't operating anymore. Um, they're taking over an existing space. Well, they're gonna have to invest a fair amount of money in getting that um, space up and running. You know, maybe they don't like the furniture inside or maybe they wanna change the grill or some, something where they're gonna have to spend money. So we don't wanna make these things um, go away after six months if they're a viable uh, business. Um, so as I said, uh, the building commissioner and I will be um, reviewing these things based on the criteria that the Zoning Board of Appeals normally uses and that the Planning Board normally uses. And we have a pretty good sense of the kinds of conditions that you usually impose and that the Zoning Board of Appeals imposes. Um, the Building Commissioner is actually very conservative, in my opinion, and um, very strict. And so he will be very um, judicious in allowing things to uh, be approved, but I th think that the answer to the question of whether it's temporary or not, it's somewhat on a case-by-case -case basis. Does it make sense? Um, if someone's using, um, you know, for an accessory use, uh, a parking space out fr in front of Antonio's, well, once um, the winter comes, it isn't going to make any sense anymore for them to continue to operate a, a part of their restaurant out in that parking space. But if someone has um, redone the inside of their building in order to have a new restaurant, that does make sense for them to continue. Um, if the person who's redoing the inside of their building also has a patio um, next to the building that he can use for seasonal outdoor dining, well, um, you know, probably that would be approved as part of his business operation. Um, because it would be on private property and it wouldn't need any uh, further approval from um, the town manager. So it really would be kind of um, case by case. And um, so I, th I think that's, that's what I have to say. Yep. Thank you, Chris. And I also just noticed in here on the draft, it says that this is only for 180 days unless extended by action of the town council. So it sounds like the town council would then have the power to, to extend this. I don't know if they can tweak it, but that's another question that I would love to know. Um, so I see Michael and then David, and then I see Janet. Michael? Thank you. Uh, three things. Uh, first of all, um, I think this is a very good idea, and I think we should move as quickly as we possibly can on it, and I think we are doing that, and I applaud that. Secondly, I have total confidence in Ms. Brestrup and Mr. Mora to make the decisions in lieu of the, the, the long deliberations and torturous processes that this board frequently goes through. Uh, they do indeed understand what the zoning bylaw says and will not make decisions just for the hell of it, they'll make decisions based on the zoning bylaw, and that's fine. I'm perfectly c confident that they'll be able to do that very well. Thirdly, uh, while I think this is a great thing to have happen very quickly, I would hate to have see this be used as the precedent for the way in which this, the uh, planning board and the um, um, CRC operates on a permanent basis. Uh, let us please not say that because this worked this emergency process work, it is the right process because it is not. Thank you. David? I, I agree with um, the, the comments just expressed by Michael. Um, I'm assuming that substantive comments about the proposed draft zoning bylaw are not relevant right now, but, but really just moving forward to that June 10 um, joint hearing. 
um, is, and that the time in between is when when we might be able to make some suggestions or some ex express that so that but but the but but giving the green light for um, uh, endorsing flexibility to support the re, re um, the, 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 the recoupment, the revitalization of, of the town is, is what's imperative. Um, and then finally, I just wonder, given that the June 3 meeting sounds packed, and given that the CRC folks are coming to the June 10 meeting, I wonder whether that presentation might be pushed to be a, a, a part of the June 10 meeting, uh, rather than being at rather than being added on to the June 3 meeting. That's a matter of scheduling, and I just put that out as a suggestion, as a possibility, um, in in order to condense the June 3 meeting and, and to make more robust the June 10 meeting. Thank you. So, may I say something? Sure. I would appreciate hearing any substantive comments now um, because I think the time that we have to deal with this is very short. So if you do have substantive comments, um, please let me know and I will, you know, try to work on um, finding out whether they're legal, um, appropriate, whatever. But um, there is time between now and June 10th to make appropriate changes to this. And I wouldn't want us to get to June 10th and then be saying, oh my goodness, if we'd only known that ahead of time, we would have checked with the town council and, you know. So if you have substantive changes that you want to let me know about, uh, please let me know. May I follow up then? Follow up? Oh, go ahead, David. Christine, um, you know, these are just thoughts. These are not proposals, they're half-baked. Again, I think the, the goal is, the, the, the goal is what I want, it was, I, I want to achieve. I, I have, I would like to encourage the reduction of any of, of uh, and this is outside of the planning board, so let me just speak that, uh, 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 in any way possible to enlarge the public's pedestrian space to enhance the possibility of social distancing to encourage greater commercial use of the space while maintaining safe safe public health uh, uh, parameters di uh, distancing um, is is to, if there's any way to reduce vehicular traffic in uh, uh, a circumscribed area as uh, suggested by the B the bid in an earlier presentation I would I would encourage that um, a, a, a car-free, pedestrian-only zone downtown sounds really attractive to me personally. Um, in terms of the, the, the matter more within the purview, I think, I have concerns about personal care establishments in, in an enhanced outdoor space. Because I just don't know what that means, again, in public health in terms of public health. I don't know about things flying that maybe oughtn't to fly. <laughs> Enough said on that. Okay. I think that the, the a third point, the ability to, re since this is, these will be decisions that are going, going to be made um, quickly as appropriate. I believe that building in an ability to review and update conditions on a regular or ongoing basis um, would be important, not to in incur unpredictability or to, to, uh, for the business owner, but to be able to respond to, oh, unintended consequences or unintended uh, uh, effects of these temporary measures, that, that, that ability. And then finally, and I appreciate your allowing my long windedness. Um, the, the issue about whether after 180 days, a new use 
becomes an, a, you know, a, a, a permanent basis. I think that that's an important issue to consider and to wrestle with. However, I think it also could be something of a red herring in that during those, that those 180 days, the, the new use, the new restaurant or the new establishment that's put into an otherwise vacant space will have an opportunity during that, that, that initial period to prepare its more proper and formal um, uh, application for, per, per, per the, the zoning bylaws as they exist prior to adoption potential adoption of this temporary measure. I hope that that was clear enough. And again, I think that the, the, the goal and the effort is what's really important that, and that all businesses should be given all signals that this would be going forward in order to try to um, uh, 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 get us back on our feet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Janet, and then after that is Maria. So um, I, I would like to agree, um, support what people are saying about the need to support our businesses and help help the businesses in town get back on their feet. Um, I already sent an email to Chris with some of my comments, so I'm actually going to go through them quickly. But one of the things I didn't send to Chris is I understand like the need for speed for waiving parking requirements and um, for outdoor dining seating arrangements and on the public way, I could see that as a priority that has to happen very quickly, um, you know, to get to see, so people can capture summer, summer business when they're able to um, serve again. Um, on the other hand, I know summer is a slow time for Amherst businesses and there's probably not gonna be a lot of camps and it's probably gonna be slower than normal. So I think that, perhaps we'll buy some more time for a, a more slower process for approving new businesses. So I wonder if we can sort of tease out those two issues because um, it seems like a new business can go through the usual process. And I think the PB, the planning board and the ZBA can prioritize these new businesses and ex expedite their own processes for approval and things like that. So I do have this concern about approving new businesses or new uses and having regrets later. Um, going to my hit list of changes I'd like to see in the, um, the proposed bylaw is yes to put a time limit on all the permits and require them to be renewed. Um, that would give us a chance in six months to, to go through the usual process, see what's working. You know, maybe having outdoor dining was really hellish for the toy box or some other business and we can kind of revisit that and how it worked. Um, maybe the new business, there's something really odd about the way they're operating or, or you know, it's incongruous. Maybe it's a sex toy shop or something. It's, it's not all hopefully just restaurants downtown. I'm not advocating for um, that kind of business. But I think, that, I think that requiring a renewal, knowing that if they're complying, it will just go through, would give us time to sort of address problems in a slower way. Um, I would eliminate the 10 day time limit for the inspector to act. I think that's too fast. I think that I trust the building inspector and Christine, our planning director to go as quickly as possible, but 10 days is pretty quick and things can come up. Like maybe the fire chief doesn't get back in time. Maybe someone takes a vacation or gets sick. And all of a sudden you're required to approve a plan and a change that maybe you don't have support. So I would say maybe a 15 day time limit, knowing that your goal is to go faster you might get 10 applications for um, outdoor dining and can't really sort them out in that time. Um, maybe give the, the applicants a choice of going through the regular procedures because um, it might go be faster going through the planning board. Um, and then not to create a whole new set of application procedures and requirements. I, would, I don't think our procedures for applications are, the, it, they're actually seem very clear to me. And um, I sort of had this Guantanamo Bay issue where they didn't want to use, you know, when they were doing the um, people they held there, they didn't want to use the criminal, federal criminal procedures, and they didn't want to use the, you know, the, the war crimes people, or they didn't want to use the, the procedures for war, and they made it the third set of procedures, and they've been arguing and litigating it ever since. So I thought, in a way, it'd be faster just to use our current application procedures, and you're all familiar with it. And then I had a question about the notice to abutters 
and it sounds like there's no hearing. And so how would abutters or businesses and neighbors know that the application has been made, that they can have some input, and then even if they dislike the outcome to appeal? Like how do those notification requirements and participation requirements met in this informal procedure? The other thing I just thought of as, as Christine was talking is I don't really understand the status legally of an administrative approval versus a special permit and a permit for site plan review. I don't know what, if, if they said, well, this was an administrative approval under a temporary thing, like what's its legal status? Is, there, is it different from a regular permit? So those are sort of my hit list, thank you. But I do very much support the need to help these businesses. And I, I know we're all trying ourselves, but we're probably not enough people and bringing more people to town with outdoor seating and kind of fun stuff sounds fantastic. Thank you. Maria? Sorry, I thought someone was going to answer, Janet. Um, I, I think that we should definitely do this expedited process, not go through normal hoops for this period of the, um, the social distancing. And I think that as we reduce the social distancing, businesses will be able to figure out how to get their normal sort of plan with the space they have. Um, my questions are more administrative Chris, for you to ask as you're writing the bylaw, um, what are the, um, I know it says the uh, required application and submission requirements are temporarily suspended, but then what is it? Is it a hand-drawn plan? Is it, you can ignore um, providing lighting or traffic or parking? Like what is the, I guess, submission? Because um, if it's something that they are still going through the normal hoops of like hiring a, a civil or architect or interior designer, or are you actually making the process like a very shortened, um, yeah, I guess I just, I'm not clear on what the submission requirements are. So maybe if you're drafting that up later, I'll see it, but it, it just sound like it was like everything was temporarily suspended and I wasn't sure what exactly you and Rob Moore would be reviewing, but. I don't need to know the details now, but just to make sure that's clear in, in the uh, draft, uh, yeah, in the bylaw that you, you come up with. Good, thanks. So, um, Jack, whoop, are, yeah. are you done, Maria? Do you oh, all want that. me to try to answer these um, questions and concerns now to the extent that I can? I can go back and, and um, review the things that Janet asked about and also review what Maria asked about to the extent that I know what the answers are or not. Well, I, I think that's the point you're saying. You only have an extent right now and all this hasn't been ironed out. You're going to various people, you're going to legal counsel. Like it's just like a normal article. So I'm treating this like when we used to have pre-town meeting, all the members are giving their questions and their concerns and you're scribbling madly. So um, we're hoping that when we see the next one come out and when this is presented, because normally there'd be a little bit more time in the presenting, but I'm sure CRC has a lot of the same questions that you all are asking too. And town council will probably have the same questions if they're not answered. Mm -hmm. So this is really good. It's sort of like priming the pump for what Chris and Rob and Paul and everyone's going to have to deal with. So um, this is good. This is really good to give her this, this impact and th this feedback. So the only hand I see Jack right now, do you have more to add to this, Jack? Oh, I'm uh, totally, you know, uh, behind expediting um, provisions that, you know, allow businesses, especially the restaurants, to be able to capture some fraction of what they would normally be making uh, during this pandemic. Uh, but I, I guess the question I have is, uh, we've been talking about downtown. Take a South Amherst example, and I'm wondering how, um, you know, businesses, restaurants outside of the downtown would be able to take advantage of this, say like a mission cantina that has, you know, limited space if they're going to keep the social distancing and, and using their parking lot and then maybe not having enough parking sort of thing. What, how does this work for the, you know, businesses and locations that are outside of the downtown area, you know, in concept? Um, does it, does it, does this work for them, I guess, is a question to, to Chris. Um, I, Chris, I mean, if you want to answer, but if just take it and then maybe he's got a good point that 
you know, mm -hmm. these, there needs to be some examples. I think when this comes back to us, there needs to be a few examples of how different way, like a few examples of how it would work. So I think that gives everybody like a different view than just reading this, you know, legal memo kind of mm -hmm. thing. So what, um, maybe what I'll try to do is um, put together a list of the questions and comments that you've come up with and talk to the building commissioner and um, try to get back to you with something in writing before June 10th. Now, I didn't watch the CRC meeting, um, but they did they do something similar to this and ask a lot of questions to go be followed up on or? No, I don't think they asked a lot of questions, but there's been a lot that's been happening in the last 36 hours and I don't remember everything. Um, so I'll, I'll go back and review what they what they asked. I don't know if Janet was there at the CRC meeting. Yesterday. Yeah, I didn't go yesterday. No. Okay. Well, then, if they didn't ask, well, this is great that you all gave all this feedback and questions to Chris because this is priming and getting ready so that um, this stuff doesn't come up the last minute when we're trying to improve things. So, mm -hmm. um, thank you. I see David and then Janet. Do you still have your hand up, Janet, or no? Yeah. I can take it. Yes. You do. Oh no, it's gone. Um, David. You want to come back? I, I just wanted to respond to Jack's, you know, one of Jack's questions, which I think is, you know, makes a lot of sense. However, it's not our job. So for the Mission Cantina, you know, what their proposal is, that's, that's their proposal. The, 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 this temporary, this, this, this action by the town, if it were to take it, enables them to make the proposal. They make the proposal. And then, and then, and it's authorizing whoever it authorizes. The current draft is is the building commissioner and the planning director to review it and condition it, approve it or not. Um, but get, it's, it, it's right. on the it, it's it's on the it's on the business to go. Hey, for us to to try to make this work, given given the situation, this is our proposal. You know, that's that's not on our. I don't think that's on the town's um shoulders um it's it's for it's for the town to go that okay let's see how that works go for it you know save jobs make money save jobs that's that's just uh, i just wanted to respond to that one point there thank you great and just to remind like um you know, everyone's got good points going here, but part of this is businesses asking to do business in the public way. So they may propose something that takes up the whole way, but then I am assuming that it will be Chris and Rob and Paul Bockelman who tweak it and sort of negotiate it out and then a final agreement is made. So I think there's going to be so much of a case by case basis with this. It's it's going to be a lot, but at least we're doing our part with this and we'll get this moving and it will come back to us. Um, Chris, I assume we will get like later drafts of this. Is it, is it sort of cooks out before the 10th when we actually have to vote on it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, I see one more hand, Michael. Yeah, it's important to remember based on uh, Jack and, and, uh, and David's uh, comments, uh, this, bylaw is not going to help every business in town. There are some businesses that aren't going to be able to make use of outside work or public way or any of these other things. Uh, some will, but there may be some that won't. And I think we can't worry, well, we, we can worry about and feel bad for those businesses that, that are in such a constrained physical location that they can't take advantage of this bylaw. But there will be some that can't, I think, and that we have to acknowledge that. It's so true. This isn't going to fix everyone. I was talking to um, one of the hair salonists at Hair by Harlow and was like, oh, could you ever make use of the outdoors or extra space? Because I was thinking of this. And as they said, they need power for hair dryers, which has that blowing stuff, David, that you were talking about. But, you know, they're, they need water and they're using chemicals. So they, this won't really help them. But, you know, it might help somebody else. So... We might as well try something. So, um, Chris, thank you for fine tuning this and continuing to work on this. Um, mm -hmm. And if anybody has more comments, they think of something in the next day, can they send, send you an send email? Send it to me via email, okay. yeah. 
All right. Um, I see Janet has her hand up and then we'll move on. Janet, we cannot hear you. Your mic is off. I can try to. Well, um, my hand, I kind of raised and it kept on lowering. So I should just say that. Um, I was at a bike store today and there were five people waiting to be served. And there were three people. I mean, they made five sales with like two or three salespeople just bringing things out. And I began to wonder if a reduction in options actually would facilitate businesses. But I do think it's it can be done and things can happen outside that usually happen inside. Um, and then obviously space is needed. Um, I, I feel like this is such an important bylaw and I, I think it's a huge waiver and I want to really get it right. And so I was hoping that maybe we, I don't know what we've been talking about the schedule and I've kind of lost track of it, but maybe to get more information on, on the different drafts and the answers to questions and put that on to our next um, planning board meeting to discuss in a deeper way or I just, I, I just think this is so important. It just seems more important than almost everything on our list. So I don't, I don't want to change the schedule too many times, but that's my plea. That's it. Uh, Chris? So I, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, it's, it's really up to you with, when you want to discuss 40R. As far as I'm concerned, 40R can be put on a sort of mid burner. It doesn't need to be on the front burner. I agree. And that is something that you did have on the schedule for June 3rd. So if you want to drop 40R to a different uh, later date, then you p would potentially have more time to talk about um, this topic on June 3rd. So I'm up for that, Chris, if, if that's all right with others. All we were going to be doing is just taking some more comments and looking. We're, we're not moving on anything with that. So if mm -hmm. that could get pushed a couple of weeks, um, that, then we can open up a space to have the latest and greatest of this amendment come, uh, article come to us and some discussion for questions being answered. And if we're deferring 40R consideration, we could defer a little bit the responses to Chris about the 40R. Yep. Good. That's fine. All right, so we'll adjust that uh, agenda, Chris, later. Um, and I see David. Uh, I, I just want to, again, speak directly to the point. Bicycle stores are considered essential businesses today, um, understandably. And in the past three days, I've seen stories in, you know, the, the, the few publications that I still am stupid enough to read about how if you want to get a bicycle you're going to wait long in line and so it's creating a kind of panic to get your you know bicycle stuff and so it's great that the bicycle store is getting business and it's great that they're getting the business outside it's all those other ones that have been shuttered that and and all the other workers who were trying who i think expediting this where we're trying to um, enable and that's all it's great that the bikes stores are getting the business but there has been these stories the past couple of days and they're essential um, and that's all thank you um, so at this time I don't see any more hands so I am going to move on um, and I'm going to move on to item um, seven uh, are there any ANR subdivision uh, Chris? Yes, yeah. and Pam will be able to show it to you. Um, Pam. There, there is an yeah. ANR. It's an interesting situation because it hasn't actually been filed with the town clerk yet. But um, yeah, we, we're we having a little trouble getting things into our system. It hasn't been filed with the town clerk and it hasn't been sent to Jason Skills Town Engineer. So, but the idea is it's a um, property that is Colonial Village. And you're all familiar with Colonial Village. So um, if Pam can get that up on the screen, I think it was one of the last things in our packet. Yeah, there's a map. Can you, can you see that I'm scrolling through the packet? No, I see you, Pam. Okay, here we go. Again. <laughs> oh. But that's nice, too. Oh, <laughs> oh look at David. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, nice of you. All right, let's see. Why is it doing that? I can hold it up. 
for anybody. Oh, geez. To see. <laughs> It is in their packet. It is. So we all have it. It's one of the last things in your packet. And it's essentially Colonial Village owns a lot of property. And um, they have different parcels. I think they have three or four different parcels. And they're trying to um, consolidate it into one parcel. But they're also doing a little bit of a land swap with Amir, Amir McChi, who owns property to the north of Colonial Village. So there it is, Pam. Okay. I was going to say, can you see it now? Excellent. So we've put a yellow line around the outside of the um, proposed uh, parcel. Um, it's a little um, daunting to try to figure it out. But what I'm asking you to do is to authorize Christine Gray Mullen to sign this as an A and R, um, because yeah, I'm not going to be able to show it to you in person. If you wanted to look at it in person, you could come and meet me in the parking lot behind Town Hall, and I would show you the plan, and I'd be happy to do that. But this is the best we can do for now. So you can see all the buildings in Colonial Village. The road that goes uh, sort of um, slantwise um, is Belchertown Road, and the road that's at the bottom is Southeast Street. Um, there are there is at least one parcel. I think it's Map 15C, Lot 42, that is currently a separate parcel, and that one would be uh, combined into this bigger parcel. You can see a little inset over to the left. Um, so you see map 15 C lot 42 right there. Um, and that is going to be added into the, the Colonial Village parcel. It's already owned by them, but they're just going to put it all together. And then, um, and this is gonna be a little hard to explain. They're doing that land swap with, with um, Amir. They're um, giving him a little wedge shaped piece up on the, on the left hand side, it says it's called lot two and it's kind of a skinny little piece. So they're going to give that to Amir. It's in the inset. Can you see lot two over on the left hand side? Yes. Pam, you can maybe see that. Mm -hmm. And then um, Amir is giving them lot three. And lot three is um, the kind of wedge-shaped piece down below. Pam, can you put your mouse on lot three there? Um, I haven't even found it yet, so you tell me if oh, I'm hot or... Oh, God, how do I... Yeah, oh, a oh, little close. bit down. Oh, here's two. Yeah. Yeah. Here's and three. There you go. All right. <laughs> I couldn't find it. <laughs> So I do not three. You can kind of. And so they're just they're, doing a swap, Chris? They're doing a swap. You can see in the yellow, um, there's a little a chunk out. So lot two, mm -hmm. actually I said it backwards. Lot two is going to Amir. I think I said it right. backwards. And the wedge shaped piece is coming to Colonial Village. Yeah, it's the wedge shaped piece. Right. Yeah, wood shaped pieces right there with right him, Mr. Arrow. Why? Why? Um, I think that a colonial village has a desire to, well, they're going to do two things. One is very small, and the other one is pretty significant. Um, the very small thing is that they're acquiring playground equipment from North Village, North Village, which has been. Um, is going to be vacated and will be demolished and rebuilt. So they're getting some playground equipment from North Village. And in addition, that's the small thing they're going to do. The big thing they're going to do is they're going to add buildings to this property here that's uh, surrounded by yellow. Um, and that really hasn't, um, they've just had a preliminary discussion with us about it. Um, and they will be refining their proposal and then coming back and talking to us. It would be a Zoning Board of Appeals application. And before it goes to the Zoning Board, you would have an opportunity to review it. Um, but that's, that's what's being thought about here. 
So again, we don't have any proposal on it yet. I don't have anything in my office about it, but they're nice. talking about doing that. And they do, it's actually something that um, I would say the town, uh, in the form of town hall, um, would support because it's an existing um, property that is a non-conforming use. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what zoning district this is, but I think it's a residential zoning district. So it's a non-conforming use and they'd be ex expanding the non-conforming use to add um, apartment units to a property that's already developed. And that's what our master plan says. Our, our master plan says that we want to focus development in uh, places that are already developed. So, but that, as I said, that's not really what's coming to you tonight. What's coming to you tonight is this proposal to um, incorporate all of this land into one parcel and do that land swap with Amir. So, I think there's uh, also a lot four down below. You see the lot four? So I think they're gonna be giving that little sliver of lot four right there. It's just there, yeah. That will also go to Amir. Okay. okay. Um, so questions on this, uh, Janet, I see your hand and Doug, I did see your hand, but it's down now, but Janet. I'm gonna lower my hand. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so um, at this point, raise your hand if anyone has a problem with this and doesn't think I should sign this or they have another question. Um, I don't see any hands. So um, Chris, I, I think we're good with this. All right, so you and I can make an appointment to um, meet in the parking lot and get your signature. <laughs> and, and, okay. Yep, sounds good. Uh, David, your hand just popped up. My hand did just pop up. <laughs> um, What, what, it, it, is there any time sensitivity to this? Chris, um, as as you know. Is there time sensitivity? Well, I'll tell you what. We received this application, I'm going to say it was a while ago. It was probably a week or two ago. And technically we have, in the old world, before COVID-19, we would have had 21 days to um, review this. Um, so the new world says that, um, deadlines like that are what we call told, meaning that they don't really exist during COVID-19. Uh -huh. Um, so if you wanted to wait till June 3rd to uh, endorse this or think about it or whatever, you could probably do that. Um, I did tell Tom Reedy that I was going to bring this before you tonight, but, I don't think there's any big rush to do this. Probably two more weeks isn't going to kill anybody. So but Tom Reedy is representing whom? Tom Reedy is representing Alan Cohn, who owns the property. Alan owns this property and he owns presidential apartments and he may own other um, apartment complexes in Amherst. Colonial Village, that is. Colonial Village, that's right. Uh-huh. So this is for Colonial Village to unite all their properties into one property and do a couple of those tiny little land swaps. Um, David, what would you want Chris to bring back to us two weeks from now as the sort of the game changer for this? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about and perplexing on a map here. Well, let me make it a little bit easier for you. Um, what an ANR is, is approval not required. Uh -huh. so it's a statement made by the planning board that this, uh, whatever is being proposed here, does not require subdivision approval. So uh -huh. subdivision approval yeah. usually involves um, building a roadway and creating lots off the roadway and putting um, utility infrastructure in the roadway. And so in my mind, that is not what is being proposed here. So I think the statement that subdivision control law does not apply in this case and subdivision approval is not required is a reasonable statement to make. That's why I'm comfortable with signing it. 
Um, Michael? Well, I was just going to ask, oh, Jack, uh, or uh, sorry, David, what the, what the issue was, why he was somewhat reluctant. Well, I don't have any problem with it, to be honest with you. No, uh, no, yeah. uh, fact, no uh, uh, reluctant because I'm looking at this map with bad light in my, my, my third floor office here. And, and I'm trying to, and, and I, I think that that's, a, that's a, an excellent uh, explanation. Um, how about this? How about if um, David meets me and outside of the town hall and I show him the map and we talk about it from a distance? <laughs> no, actually, are... actually I'm, com I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. I just didn't want to... Uh, um, uh, with just with, with an extra three minutes uh, because I'm slow um, or 10 minutes because I'm so slow you know, just to be able to think about it and, and rather than rubber stamp it. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel comfortable with it. Right. I, I do too, um, knowing in what context it's for. So um, if David's okay, if everyone's good, Chris, we can make a time and I'll, I'll sign this. Okay, and I would do want to hear from the um, town engineer. Pam's got to put it into the system. We'll hear from the town engineer, so it probably won't get signed until sometime next week. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to uh, item eight, upcoming ZBA applications. Pam? Pam uh, might not have had time to do that. Um, well, I, I'm not aware of anything new, Chris. Do we have okay. new? Well, I probably told you all about Elsie Fetterman wanting to convert her one family house to a two family house on Long Oh, a long Street. time ago. Yeah. I probably told you about Valley CDC coming with 28 units and mm -hmm. Colonial Village Playground and 32 North Prospect Street building a deck. So, yeah, you've heard about all those things already. <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, item nine upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. The things I've already told you about, all about learning and the common school paving. Okay. Um, and uh, I, item 10 is planning board committee and liaison reports. I'm just going to ask for a show of hands at this time, if there's any hands that want to go up and report something. Um, yes. Uh, Michael, okay. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, there it is. Um, <laughs> for the, I, my eye, yes. Uh, for the... Um, uh, uh, community, uh, for the design review board. Uh, we uh, last week reviewed the um, um, Kendrick Park proposal, which we've already acted on tonight, and this, and approved the uh, removal of the change in two signs on the uh, uh, Bank North, um, or no, TD Bank on, uh, on Travel Street. And for the uh, Community Preservation Act Committee, uh, there is no report. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands, so at this time we'll move on. Report of chair, um, I don't have anything. Uh, report of staff, Chris, do you have anything? I don't have anything right now, no. Um, then I'm just gonna cue you about a couple things. One was, um, I'll do the easier one first. We had talked the other day, if you could ask um, if Pam could set up a doodle poll for the meetings through the summer for the planning board members uh, to expect mm -hmm. that. Um, to So, you know, I know a lot of people are probably not going away, but some people do still go away. So, um, and there is the possibility that if you have good Wi-Fi, you could still Zoom into the meeting. So it's thinking about that. Can you attend a Zoom meeting? Because the meetings will still be Zoom through the summer. So um, thank you, Pam and Chris, for sending that out this week. Um, and the second thing, Chris, was just Michael, during our break, had brought up this. Um, the GIS, you had this in our packet, and he was just wondering, I know it was a part of your master plan you know, these are great GIS maps and whether or not, you know, appendices, you started to touch on it, but I assume Ben had been working on these. Or? Yes, Ben was working on them and I think they're pretty self-explanatory if you read them. They look sort of daunting when you just glance at them, but um, if you want me to, I can quickly go through them. Um, and if you have them in your hands, uh, you can look at them. 
the first page is um, indicative of the kinds of anomalies that we see where, and he's taking uh, different um, years of the GIS maps and comparing them to one another. So if you look at the one on the far left, um, we're looking at Echo Hill, which is exactly where I am right now, because that's where I live. Um, so in 1999, um, Echo Hill was the, the top one, Pam. The, yeah, this one right here that you've got. Yep, that's good. Okay. The one on the far left, uh, Echo Hill appeared to be bare like a desert. And <laughs> Echo Hill wasn't a bare desert in 1999. It had plenty of trees. In fact, I lived here then. Um, but it was shown as residential use. So it was shown as all bare. Um, in the next slide, we have 2005 Mass GIS. Oh, Just look at where it is. Right here. Yep, I um, see. Went to the right of the first one. And that's um, the 2005 rendition of uh, Echo Hill. And you can also see Jenks Street up there to the north. And it makes it look like all of a sudden there were the trees grew like mad between 1999 and 2005, and that's obviously not true. Um, so it's showing, you know, little pieces of yellow where the houses are. Um, and then the next slide over, 2016, it makes it look like Echo Hill is in the middle of, you know, the national forest. And so you can see the, the problem we have in comparing um, years of maps. If you compare 1999 to 2016, what is in yellow in 1999 is residential use. And what's in yellow in 2016 is residential use. So you would be under the impression that we had lost a lot of residential use in Amherst and that we had gained a lot of forest land. Well, the forest land and the residential use occupy the same place. So we have to figure out how to explain this in our master plan update. That um, the information is, was characterized differently uh, 20 years ago than it is today. Um, but you know the place is the same. It just appears completely differently in these maps. So that's a conundrum that we're discussing um, with the IT department and um, our new fellow, Ben, who happens to be very knowledgeable about GIS. Uh, that just gives you a sense of the kinds of things that we are wrestling with. I think you can um, you know, review these maps at your leisure. They are, they're not that hard to uh, figure out. Um, the, the later ones have a table next to them that explains what they're all about. And the next time we talk about the master plan, um, we can talk about some of these um, maps and tables. So how's that? Is that good? Thank you. I see Michael's hand up. Yeah, I, the, the reason I asked the question was because I wasn't sure how they related to the master plan document. Are they supposed to be an appendix to section three or are they going to be incorporated in section three? Or, or what exactly is their ultimate use? And also, uh, I, I have a hard time. I don't, I have a pretty decent magnifying glass. And even with that, I can't read the text in the, the, uh, the uh, uh, legend of the, uh, on the first page. So this is um, part of a question I have for you. Uh, initially, I asked Ben and the IT department to fill me in on the um, information that's in the land use section of the, bio, of the master plan where it says, you know, X number of acres are now agricultural land. Um, and this is an increase of 20% over 1999. I asked him for simple information like that. So in order to get that simple information, he went back and, and looked at how um, the information was compiled back when the 2010 master plan uh, came about. And he realized that um, the information in the appendices was where he had to go to try to figure out how they got that information. So he got really involved in um, looking at, at the land use chapter in the appendices and trying to figure it out. So that's where these maps came from. So one of my questions to you is, do you think that people are going to care about um, updating the appendices? And I'm hoping that you'll say no. And that what is important is the information that, um, that we and my staff can glean out of it 
to put into the update, such as how many acres are currently in conservation, how many acres are currently in residential use. So the, the numbers that um, were in the original master plan in the text portion, where we're comparing one thing and another, um, is what we are really in, uh, interested in. And we don't really care about updating all of those appendices because I feel like that is a big project. That's probably something that would require um, the help of a consultant to do. Yeah. We're probably not, um, we don't have the staff to really do all of that during this update. So um, does that, does that Michael? answer? Yes, that's that's exactly what I was thinking. The maps are very interesting as uh, as a as a <laughs> as a study of maps, but they don't provide any more information than is than we would otherwise come from the, the current map and the information that could be gleaned from the current map. And I think the information in text form for this purpose is much more useful than the information in visual form. Okay, good. That's what I hope you said. And um, oh no, I don't see any more hands. Okay. Um, great. Thank you for that, Chris. All right. So at that point, I think we have adjournment. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. And I know someone's going to second it. Great. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Amherst Media. Thank you, Planning Board, for all your time and hard work. We're covering a lot of stuff. So I'll see you on the third. And remember, Chris will be sending out emails with lots of do things. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pam and Stan. Thank you, Chris. And Good thank night, you, Pam. Thank you. Bye, Pam. You're welcome. Good night. Thanks, Thanks everybody. You, Audie, have a great weekend. You too. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end it. Oh, wait, I got to stop recording. High five. <laughs> iPhone. Boom. <laughs> Chris. All right. Now we're done recording. Wait, you want All right. All right, Jack, one thing. Remember I said three hours and 15 minutes.